We are live. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. We're going to be talking about the Exodus today. The debate, is the Exodus a myth or is it actual history? This is a serious question that scholars still wrestle around today. And there's been a recent publication in an evangelical book where there are five views of the Exodus. And in that book, various views from uh, cultural memory all the way to an early Hyksos expulsion all are covered within this text. So today I have a couple experts, um, PhDs, if you will, in the field, that are going to be debating my good friend, Jonathan <laughs> Jonathan Sheffield, and he's an autodidact. And Jonathan actually pressed this on me. He said, Derek, we got to have this discussion, man. And I said, you know what? Let's do it. And as my friend, I said, you know, let me see if I can talk to some of these other experts because I have communication with them and see if they'd be happy to join. Jonathan's been debating a lot of people, a lot of PhDs, and I just want to say that up front, he is trying to figure things out. This is me going to bat for my friend Jonathan here, even though me and him have different ontologies. At the end of the day, he said, Derek, put me in front of some of these people. I would love to share my view, and he is trying to learn from others as well. With that being said, I also would hope and want other PhDs in the field down the road to join in the discussion, whether it's debate or discussion doesn't matter. Uh, we did try to approach Dr. David Falk, but of course, that that is an issue where he doesn't do debates. And I may have stirred up some waters in that case where that may not happen. Don't know. At the end of the day, we're going to be seeing a debate here today. And I hope you guys join in. Try and be as open-minded as you can. I know it's difficult because we always have a football team that we're rooting for. But with that being said, let's get our intro started. And if you have any questions, super chat them. And I'll ask them during the q and I'll ask them in the order that I receive them. And uh, we're going to have an opening on each side, 20 minutes each. And then we're going to go into an open discussion, then Q&A. Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. Thank you, everybody, for joining me today here on the Exodus debate, whether it happened or not, if it did, what happened, etc. I uh, really look forward to hearing each person's perspective, and we'll be opening first having Jonathan Sheffield and CJ Cox. They're going to go first with a 20-minute opening. I want everyone to know they have YouTube channels. Be sure to go down in the description and uh, join them and subscribe. Go check them out. I don't care if you agree with them at the end of the day. You can't deny the cartoons that Jonathan produces aren't magical. And also, if you're a mod for Myth Vision, do me a favor. Go hunt some of these channels. Post them. Brag about them in the comment section. I'd love to see that happen for Dr. Joshua Bowen. His book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, which part two is coming. And I think we're going to be talking more about some of the details that might be talked about today. And also we have Dr. Maggie Bryson. She's an Egyptologist. So I didn't want to spend too much time, but is there anything in the intro that you would like to plug about yourself before we actually have the introduction where you start on the Exodus? No one's, no one, everyone wants to be humble. Everyone wants to be like, no, let's just do this. Let's get our, let's get our, uh, as you saw the tombstone scene, I'm your Huckleberry. Let's get our weapons drawn and let's start. Okay. Um, we'll let, uh, Jonathan and CJ go first. And then after that, we'll have Dr. Josh and Dr. Maggie Bryson. Okay. Just let me know when, uh, everything's up on screen. Good to go. And give me one second just to get started. Okay. A racehorse, a murder, and a dog that did not bark. What do these factors tell us about a particular case? And how do they relate to our proposed investigation of the Exodus narrative? In the 1892 book, The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle offers us a short story that ties these pieces together a mystery entitled The Silver Blaze, which documents the disappearance of a famous racehorse the night before the murder of the horse's trainer. 
Sherlock Holmes solves the mystery in part by focusing his attention to a curious incident. He recognized that on the night of the murder, none of the people he spoke to in his investigation remarked that they had heard barking from the watchdog. This fact that the dog did not bark at the intruder when you would expect it to do so while a horse was being stolen led the detective to the conclusion that the evildoer was not a stranger to the dog. Instead, they were someone the dog recognized, and thus the dog did not bark. The significance of Holmes' investigation is he was able to draw a conclusion from a negative fact, that is, the barking that did not occur to assist in solving the case. Therefore, we learn from this story that the absence of expected facts can have immense meaning. In building our case for a historic exodus, the principles of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's short story will become quite applicable to the investigation at hand. In truth, modern scholarship's alternative to the Jewish records is a naturalistic explanation reliant on an argument based on silence. However, the silence does go both ways. According to ancient Jewish authorities, to include Philo, Josephus, and the Talmud, the son of Ammon, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, commissioned the translation of the Pentateuch in the Greek tongue from the Hebrew around 270 BC on the island of Pharos off the coast of Alexandria. His intention? To add the Pentateuch to the universal library he was actively establishing in Alexandria. If the Exodus report is truly far-fetched, it is odd the Egyptian priests and Greek officials did not falsify a narrative that would have been viewed as a threat to the Egyptian state and religion. Hence, a curious incident of the dog that did not bark. The intent is not to draw an absolute conclusion from this silence, but instead recognize that the silence of the Egyptians and Greek officials is nevertheless as significant as the silence for Sherlock Holmes in the case of the dog that did not bark. The publication of the Pentateuch at the Library of Alexandria would have formally made the records available to the Egyptian priests and Greek officials, a reality that would have naturally subjected the Pentateuch to criticism among the ruling class and educated elites. With this in mind, how do we explain the absence of an expected fact from the record regarding such a bold claim by the Jews, especially from the Egyptian priests and Greek officials? To be clear, our argument is not based on a hypothetical assumption, but is supported by the following empirical facts of history. Fact one, in the field of Egyptian history, the Egyptian priest Manetho was quite critical of Herodotus, charging him as a falsifier of facts of several points of Egyptian history as a result of his ignorance. This initial fact offers two points of reference. Firstly, it supports our case that the Egyptians were well aware of what they perceived as errors in their sacred histories, resulting from their acquaintance with the Greek writings. Second, it provides evidence that when they encountered such errors, they responded accordingly. Oddly enough, Manetho's silence with respect to Hecataeus' Egyptian history, which included material facts that are consistent with the book of Exodus. Hence, a prime case of the dog that did not bark. Fact two, one area commonly assailed by Greek, Egyptian, and Latin authors during the Hellenistic and Roman period is the origin and early history of the Jewish nation. The literary evidence demonstrates that ancient writers frequently weighed in on this specific issue. If the Exodus were truly a myth, Surely, ancient, independent, hostile witnesses would naturally falsify the event's account by appealing to its absence in the Egyptian records. Despite this suspected reality, the histories of Tacitus, Strabo, Pompeius, Tragus, Diodorus, Apian, Celsus, and a host of others are consistent with the material facts in the book of Exodus. Yet again, we see the dog that did not bark. Thus, the absence of those expected facts supplies positive evidence supporting the validity of the Exodus report. In the case of the Exodus, our opposition often posits that the ancient testimonies on this event are late, alleging that these reports are not based on reliable data sources and are therefore not used. 
In response, let us review the evidence that explains why the ancients were in a better position than current scholars and archaeologists to inspect the source Egyptian documentation and construct an empirical history to weigh in on a Jewish exodus. Fact three, writing has existed in Egypt since around 3250 BC. Therefore, from the period before the supposed time of Joseph, a Jewish exodus, and up until the present day, there was writing in Egypt. To that end, there would seem to be no known gaps in Egyptian history that might impede our investigation. Fact four, According to Diodorus, the Egyptian priests had records which were regularly handed down in their sacred books to each successive priest from early times. This literary evidence documents the legal chain of custody for the Egyptian records via the succession of priests. What's more, it establishes that copies of the source records were preserved down through the ages. We also read in Herodotus that he saw the Egyptian priests reciting a list of its kings from its records and that Egyptians are surpassed by no nation in their strong and ever-present desire to leave upon stone or papyrus permanent records of their history, thus supporting Diodorus's testimony. Fact five, the Rosetta Stone proves that the Egyptian priests could still read the ancient hieroglyphic writings as late as 196 BC. This evidence rules out any notion that the Egyptians couldn't read the ancient hieroglyphics by that time. In fact, six, during the reign of Ptolemy I, it is said he encouraged the Egyptian priests to accumulate records of their past histories and render them available for use by Greek scholars and men of letters who he had invited to live in Egypt. His goal? To better understand how to rule a civilization that has existed for over 3,000 years. The byproduct of, of Ptolemy's actions is documented in the writings of Diodorus who tells us that many Greeks visited Thebes in the time of Ptolemy, son of Largus, and composed histories of Egypt from its source records, one of which was Hecataeus. This supports the validity of Hecataeus' writings. We can logically infer from these facts that a Greek like Hecataeus at the court of Ptolemy in Thebes, when the Egyptian temples were still operational, had an unrivaled opportunity in early Ptolemaic times of writing an excellent and accurate history of Egypt. Hecataeus' unique advantage to inspect the Egyptian sources cannot be replicated by modern scholarship today. To that end, Hecataeus' Egyptian history is a critical piece of evidence that demonstrates early Egyptian records supported the material facts of the Book of Exodus. Diodorus, who used Hecataeus' Egyptian history for his Urcus on the Jews, further corroborates that point. The Greek conquest of Egypt and surrounding territories was able to leverage the death of these nations' information centers, thereby pushing the boundaries of our knowledge, which it centralized at the Library of Alexandria, resulting in the greatest achievements of the intellect to include systematic histories of the areas. The circumstantial evidence even seems to draw the inference that Euclid was able to leverage the death of Egyptian knowledge in architecture and cartography from years of building the pyramids and control of the Nile to compile one of the greatest works in geometry. The library essentially operated as a think tank for the better part of six centuries for the Ptolemies. His scholars and the Roman Empire, I, uh, and the Roman Empire, Irenaeus spoke of Ptolemy's desire to equip his library with the writings of all men as far as they were worth serious attention. Somewhere between 200 and 700,000 estimated scrolls filled its shelves at the original museum in the royal district of the city, and about 42,000 more works located at the daughter library located in the Seraphim. The ancient historians had access to this type of information, and we do not. The documents in those libraries are lost. Therefore, by all estimation, modern scholarship is operating with at least 700,000 less documents than the ancient historians. And that's just from the Library of Alexandria. All modern scholarship has is what's left from the ancient world. 
not what was available. Therefore, the ancient testimony should have greater standing on this issue. And with that, I turn my time to um, CJ and uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bryson and Dr. Josh for allowing me to share my uh, thoughts on this issue. 10 minutes left, CJ. Thank you. Um, I do want to let everybody know I had an opening statement prepared and my computer decided that it hated me. Uh, either that or God decided he didn't want you to hear my arguments exactly how I wrote them. So I'm going to try and my best remember everything that I had here. It's not going to be too big a deal, but I just want to let you guys know if it sounds a little bit odd, that is why. And by the um, way, so anyone who wants to relinquish the remainder of their time, if for whatever reason you don't finish, you're more than welcome to do so. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I want to first get some formalities out of the way. Thank you, Drs. Uh, Bryson and Bowen for uh, having me here today and discussing this with me. Thank you, Derek, also for the hosting. And thank you, audience here. I know that me and um, Mr. Sheffield are, of course, um, I guess, hostile, you might say. Uh, so I appreciate you guys hosting us on your platform. I certainly do um, enjoy these conversations. Um, I want to go ahead and jump right into some of the arguments that I had here. The first point that I wanted to make is something which I like to call academic retreat. And that is this nasty habit the secular academics seem to have. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, did I have that? Sorry, I thought that was me. My apologies. Um, so th this nasty habit the secular academics tend to have of reaching consensus that such and such historical event from the Bible, whether it be a person, a place, or a group of people, or a thing, or whatever it happens to be, didn't actually happen, didn't actually exist, wasn't a real people group. And then when evidence comes up that inevitably shows that this is definitively the case, um, they just move on, reach consensus on a new biblical fact, and then pretend like what just happened in the last hundred years of academia didn't actually happen. Let me give a couple examples of this, okay? Um, it was only 200 years ago that academics had consensus that Nineveh did not exist. It was only 100 years ago that academics had consensus that the Hittites did not exist. It was less than 30 years ago that academics had consensus that King David did not exist. And in each one of these situations, the Bible was shown to be true through the archaeological evidence, and the scholars, without skipping a beat, reached consensus on new facts and moved on as if nothing had happened at all. There will come a time very soon when we will know beyond any shadow of a doubt the Exodus did happen, and when academics are no, are no longer entertaining the idea of Exodus mythicism. That absolutely will happen. I guarantee it will happen in our lifetime. And when it does, we're going to see the academics shuffle to a new fact, pretend that that fact is not actually based in historical evidence because we don't have the archaeology or so on quite yet, and completely miss, uh, not miss a beat here with the, um, with the academic retreat, as you will, um, attacking the Bible without any sort of a serious reason to do so. I personally would like to break that cycle. I think it's a little ridiculous. I think it shows a very clear and obvious bias against the Bible. Even if I was an atheist, I would be making the same claim to you. I don't go to everybody saying, hey, we shouldn't trust the Greek histories because they talk about Greek gods. That's not how this kind of thing works. I would hope that we could understand that that's what, that, that is a little frustrating for those who are Christians. And maybe even if you're not convinced of why I'm so skeptical of um, academics, you could at least be a little sympathetic to why I'm so skeptical, skeptical Excuse me, of academics. With that being said, I got a couple actual evidences because that, of course, is just a brief notation. So the first thing is, you guys are going to like this at first, but I promise you it's actually a good argument. The Bible says that it happened. Now, let's be clear. This is not the Bible says that it happened and the Bible is the infallible word of God. Therefore, it must have happened. Right. This is no different than saying Herodotus's histories say that Thermopylae happened. So that's evidence Thermopylae may have happened. Or the Sumerian Kings list says that Gilgamesh was a real king. So that's evidence that he may have been a real king. It doesn't prove the case. But what we have here is a very old document, in the case of the Bible, a very old collection of documents that are telling us this historical event took place. This is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, this collection of documents is actually multiple independent sources. There is no scholar who would disagree with that particular phrase. The Bible is not one book, right? The Bible is multiple books. The book of Isaiah is written by Isaiah. Uh, the book of Hosea is alleged to be written by Hosea. There's not going to be agreement in this panel as to who wrote the Torah, but it wasn't either of those two figures is the point. Um, this is actually multiple independent sources from different areas in time uh, and even from different areas of the land of Canaan. Uh, some of them may be even writing from outside of the land of Canaan. 
The second thing that makes this important is the Jewish Bible actually functions as the history of the Hebrew people. This is not just a religious text, in other words. Um, if we were to go to the Sumerian kings list, we would see that it starts off by saying, and the kingship descended from heaven, therefore making it kind of a religious text. In other words, it's describing a little bit of the religious traditions of the Sumerian people. But we also know that this particular document is giving us some historical facts, right? Or at least potentially giving us some historical facts. Uh, some of the kings on the Sumerian kings list we can verify did actually exist. But nonetheless, the point just being that uh, this is actually um, what functions as the historical collection of records uh, for the Hebrew people, right? <clears throat> um, the other thing that makes this incredibly important is, of course, that the Bible is very old. Um, this isn't a source that comes from 2020, uh, excuse me, 2021. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say that, right? That says, uh, hey, here in 2021, we believe that the Exodus happened. These are sources that come from 500 BC, 800 BC, potentially as far back as before 1000 BC, saying, hey, this is actually um, what happened in our history. So I do think that even like if you just take the uh, Christian cap off, put on your atheist cap for a moment and just simply take things at face value, the Bible saying that the um, that the excuse me Exodus did happen is indeed evidence that the Exodus did happen. The second thing that we can look at for evidence the Exodus did happen is Jewish tradition. This can be split broadly into two different categories. There is Jewish tradition which stems directly from the Exodus, and then there is Jewish tradition which stems either from Egypt, Egypt itself, excuse me, or uh, the Egyptian culture. So examples of the first, we have Passover, we have the status of the Levitical priesthood, we have where the uh, Hebrew calendar starts. There's, of course, numerous other things we could go into, but this is just a small collection of facts for the sake of time. Passover is a celebration specifically of the Exodus event. It's also a somewhat somber holiday. It's not incredibly joyous, right? You eat bitter foods, you work in haste, you commemorate that time that the death angel didn't kill your child. Uh, it's not exactly like Christmas time, right? Uh, and we have this holiday going as far back as we can actually take uh, Israelite history that demonstrates for, uh, or excuse me, that celebrates uh, this alleged event in Hebrew history. I would argue that just as the 4th of July is evidence that there is indeed an Independence Day in July 4th, 1776, you could also say that the Passover holiday is evidence that there was actually a exodus. And by the way, interesting thing about the Passover, it's not like some other holidays where we could actually associate it with a well-known um, holiday motif, if you will. In other words, it's not a um, solstice holiday. It's not a winter festival. It's not a harvest festival. Um, it seems to be a little bit random if we don't have the Passover to explain it. Uh, that second example is the status of the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is essentially a religious caste, right? This religious caste has complete and total monopoly over the religious traditions of the Hebrew people and is not able to get out of the monopoly of the traditions of the Jewish people. Where did they establish their authority from? According to the histories, Moses, the lawgiver, was a Levite. Aaron, the first high priest, was a Levite. And it was the Levites who were the loyal tribe, if you will, during the wandering time and who did Moses' bidding. This is what is considered to be their legitimacy and what actually gives them uh, you know, credit, so to speak, right? Uh, I would argue if a certain war, for example, the uh, or excuse me, if a certain dynasty, for example, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, is evidence that something gave them their legitimacy, legitimacy, namely the Augustinian Wars, right? So we could say something gave these Levites their legitimacy, and the Hebrews told us it was their very important role in an exodus. We have to give them something that gave their legitimacy. Legitimacy, excuse me. There's some reason. The rest of the Hebrew tribes submitted to the smallest and weakest of the tribes and gave them complete and total monopoly over religious matters. History says that it is the, or at least Jewish tradition, excuse me, says that it is the uh, exodus and their role in it that gives them this lofty status. Another example of this is the beginning of the Jewish calendar. Uh, a lot of people will actually say Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the Jewish calendar. One that minute. Is a modern tradition. Uh, if you read the Bible itself, it says that the first month of Nisan or Aviv, depending on what you want to call it, is act or excuse me, the month of uh, Aviv or Nisan, not the first month. It's the same thing, right? This is actually the first month of the Jewish calendar. Why is this the first month of the Jewish calendar? Well, because this is the month, at least according to the tradition, this is the month when they left Egypt, when they go and start to be their own independent people group, right? Um, this is the month of the Passover. This could potentially, depending on how quickly they actually got to Mount Sinai, uh, this could be the month that they actually had first arrived on Mount Sinai, though a lot of people think that might have actually been the third month. The point being, 
Why does the Jewish calendar start at this time? The um, uh, Gregorian calendar starts because the Julian ca calendar started on uh, January 1st and the Julian calendar started on January 1st because that's when Roman consulship started. In other words, it's not random. There is a reason the calendar starts at that time. Why does this uh, calendar start when it starts? We do have uh, historical evidence that tells us it's because of the Exodus tradition. Numerous other Jewish traditions there, but of course, we can uh, move on for sake of time. Some of these traditions that is don't time. find themselves... Say again? That's time, my friend. All right, for sure. Um, see, that's why I would have been better if I had it written out. But nonetheless, I'll go ahead and <laughs> say other stuff later. Yeah, yeah. We have open after we get done with the uh, the opponent, if I could use the term, uh, the other side's uh, opening, we'll be able to have open conversation. So now it's turned over to you, Dr. Josh and Dr. Maggie Bryson. All right. Thank you very much. I apologize. Uh, I think it's Nora in the background screaming, so it's hard to tell. All right. There's quite a bit of information that scholars discuss when dealing with the topic of the Exodus from Egypt, both, that is, both as it is presented in the narrative of the Hebrew Bible and as it can be understood from historical and archaeological sources. There are several interpretations that scholars hold with respect to this evidence. The more traditional position, that the Exodus was a historical event that took place in the 15th century, much as it is described in the Hebrew Bible, is held by only a small number of scholars. Those that believe that there is likely at least a historical kernel that lies behind the events appear to make up the majority view, with a small percentage of these arguing for the general historicity of the events as described in the Exodus. Those that conclude uh, that there is some historical event or events that stand behind the story generally conclude that they would have taken place in the 13th century BCE. Finally, there are other theories that consider the Exodus to be either not historical or to have become a cultural memory that was passed on and reworked to suit the needs of those transmitting the story. Let's begin with the data that scholars have to work with. The first references to the Exodus tradition or traditions comes, uh, come from the texts of the Hebrew Bible itself. Perhaps the earliest can be found in Exodus 15, the so-called Song of the Sea. Dating at the earliest to the end of the second millennium BCE, these 18 verses present some aspects of the story as it appears in the book of Exodus, but clearly does not contain many of its key features. In addition, the oracles of Balaam, found in Numbers 23 and 24, may date to the 9th or 8th centuries. Again, this text appears to show that an Exodus tradition in some form was known to the writer, but it is not the complete story as we have it in the book of Exodus. Two of the early prophets, Hosea and Amos, contain passages in their books that speak of the exodus from Egypt. As with the Song of the Sea and the Oracles of Balaam, while the prophetic writings date relatively early, in the 8th century, they do not appear to contain a full or closely parallel version of the exodus tradition seen in the other texts. Finally, the Merneptah Stila, the earliest known reference to a people group known as Israel, was, while not an example of the exodus tradition per se, shows that by 1207 BCE, there existed a group of Israelites that were significant enough to be combated and documented by the Egyptian pharaoh. There is also some evidence from Egypt itself that bears on the Exodus discussion. Beginning with the textual data, there is an incredibly important and sometimes overlooked group of texts that was found at Tel El Amarna, dating to the 14th century. Because these texts describe interactions between the Pharaoh and his vassals in the land of Canaan, they are extremely valuable in determining the state of affairs that existed in Canaan during this period. Among other things, we learn that Canaan was firmly under the control of Egypt during mo most of the second half of the second millennium. This is very problematic for the Exodus story, as it would require the Israelites to leave a land controlled by Egypt and escape to another land controlled by Egypt. While the Amarna letters do not present supporting evidence for the Exodus story as told in the Hebrew Bible, there are several Egyptian papyri that establish, to greater or lesser degrees, the verisimilitude of the background of the Exodus story. We learn from these papyri that there were Canaanite slaves that escaped from Egypt, and that their route out of Egypt was in some ways similar to that which was taken by the Israelites in the story. We also see that shepherds would bring their flocks into Egypt to water them, and this was documented at the border. 
In addition to the textual evidence, there is also archaeological data that need to be considered. Perhaps the most difficult problem for a historical reading of the Exodus story as presented in the Hebrew Bible is the number of Israelites purported to have left Egypt. We read that 600,000 fighting men were said to have exited the land, leading to an estimated 2 to 3 million people participating in the Exodus in total. While several attempts have been made to reinterpret this figure, it seems that the text is presenting this number as it has always been interpreted. Indeed, other aspects of the story appear to rely on the fact that the Israelites were a massive horde that exited Egypt and were making their way through the desert to the land of Canaan. Other archaeological and historical data suggest that there was tightened security at the, at the Egyptian border, both in and out, following the expulsion of the Hyksos. This would have made the departure of a group of Israelite slaves incredibly difficult to miss. Finally, there are several toponyms that were mentioned as part of the route that the Israelites took out of Egypt, including the cities of Pithom and Ramses. While several of these toponyms could reflect circumstances as they were in the 13th century, they quite often also fit well, sometimes much better, in a later period, hundreds of years after the Exodus was supposed to have taken place. It is also incredibly important to this discussion to examine the claims of the Old Testament with respect to the Israelite conquest of Canaan. According to the biblical text, this conquest would have taken place during the Late Bronze Age, either around 1407, the conservative view, or sometime in the mid to late 13th century, the more mainstream view. In order to determine the historical validity of these accounts from an archeological perspective, we need to ask two questions of the data. First, do we see occupation of the city said to have been destroyed in the narrative during the Late Bronze Age? And second, if there was occupation during this period, was that occupation destroyed at the required time? Put more simply, if the Bible says that the Israelites destroyed these cities, were there people in them? And does the archaeology show that these cities were destroyed? We begin with three cities that are purported to have been destroyed before the Israelites crossed the Jordan, Arad in the Negev and Heshbon and Dibon in the Transjordan. At Arad, following occupation in the 3rd millennium BCE, the site was abandoned until after the Late Bronze Age. Thus, there was no city in existence for the Israelites to destroy. A similar picture is painted by the archaeology of Heshbon, which shows no occupation earlier than 1200 BCE. Finally, at Dibon, we see early Bronze Age levels, followed by a break in occupation, which is only reestablished in the Iron Age. In all three sites, there appear to be no late Bronze Age remains of cities that the Israelites could have destroyed. The situation does not improve much as we cross over into Canaan. Beginning with Jericho, despite some debate over the dating of some of the features, especially a wall from the early Bronze Age, at most there was a small unwalled village at Jericho at the time when the Israelites are said to have destroyed it. This, of course, is completely at odds with the biblical account. When we move to the city of Ai, the situation is much like a rod and debone before. There was occupation at the site in the third millennium, but the city was abandoned during the Late Bronze Age. When the site was reoccupied around 1200, it showed no fortifications. With Jericho and Ai standing firmly at odds with the stories of the book of Joshua, we turn to Lachish. There was occupation at the site during the Late Bronze Age, with a destruction occurring around 1200. However, the archaeology shows that Lachish was immediately rebuilt, rebuilt as a Canaanite city, which poses problems for the biblical story. Finally, when we examine the archaeology of Hatsur, which is the one city that may fit, at least in part, with the Old Testament narrative, we see that the city was destroyed in the mid to late 13th century. This is incredibly problematic for a traditional date, and could still be problematic depending on wit when in the 13th century it was destroyed. Nevertheless, it may fit well with the biblical narrative. And although the site was abandoned for approximately two centuries after its destruction, it does appear to have been ultimately occupied by the Israelites. Several different models have been advanced over the last century, including both outsider Israelites coming from outside Canaan, 
and insider models, Israelites being indigenous to Canaan. It appears that scholars have concluded that both outsider models, both conquest and peaceful infiltration, as well as the insider model known as the Peasant's Revolt, are no longer tenable given the archaeological data now known. Instead, nearly everyone appears to agree that the Israelites were in fact Canaanites who settled down in the hill country. The debated issue is who these Canaanites were, for example, pastoralists or disenfranchised city dwellers. The bottom line is this, the story of the Israelite conquest as told in the Old Testament appears untenable in light of the archeological evidence. No single mass of outside conquerors entered into Canaan and destroyed multiple Canaanite strongholds. This picture simply does not match the archeological record. With all of this in mind, what can we say about the story of the Exodus as we read it in the Old Testament? First, the Exodus as described is not historically reliable. Not only do we lack evidence for the events described in the book of Exodus, but the historical situation that we know of in the late Bronze Age in Egypt and Canaan is incongruent with the events described in the text. As Prop observes, archaeologists and textual historians agree that the biblical narrative is not contemporary with purported events, has a complex literary prehistory, and does not fit comfortably with known ancient Near Eastern history. In order to overcome seemingly impossible details, like two to three million people leaving Egypt at one time, significant reinterpretations are required that appear to be quite problematic. Second, the story does have verisimilitude. The background to the narrative has many aspects that generally fit with the circumstances of the second millennium. It would be unwise to conclude that none of the concepts or themes in the Exodus narrative can be found in the world of ancient Egypt and Canaan. There were Canaanite slaves in Egypt. Egypt did enslave and control the Canaanite population in Canaan itself. There were slaves that escaped from Egypt. In fact, it is quite likely that this familiar and reasonable backdrop made it easier for the story to remain in popular usage. However, and this is very important, just because some or even many of the toponyms or general backdrop might fit well in the second millennium, we must remember two things. First, they do not fit in a specific moment in time. Many of these events took place spread out over the second millennium. Second, just because the story contains some genuine elements or even memories, we cannot simply conclude that the story as a whole is therefore true. As we often say, no one would conclude that Spider-Man is a true story simply because it took place in New York City. In the end, what matters most about the story? Is it that a literal two to three million people were miraculously delivered from captivity following 10 supernatural plagues being inflicted upon wicked Egyptians? No, I don't think so. What matters most, in my opinion, is how the story has been used by believers to, to sustain them through periods of great difficulty. Indeed, stories can be incredibly powerful. William Propp has brilliantly described the development of the miraculous story of the Battle of Mons during World War I. The British soldiers, under a fighting retreat, came to believe that they had been delivered by angelic beings who fought for them against the Germans. This was not an isolated story, but became an international account of deliverance, even making its way into some sources as purported history. What are we to make of such a story, and how can it help us understand the Exodus? Prop writes, quote, We know that the Battle of Mons occurred. We know its precise dates. We know its exact location. We know the historical context. We can date Machen's story to the day. We can supply oral and written testimony from literally thousands, probably tens of thousands of diverse sources to gain a stereoscopic image of the, of the times. In other words, we have precise reference points to support the historical analysis. Yet for all this historical information surrounding the events in question, there is universal consensus that angels did not miraculously defeat the German army at the Battle of Mons. But did that really matter at the time? In a very real sense, it did not. Right or wrong, such a story not only bolstered the confidence of the soldiers who believed they had been divinely delivered out of harm's way, but also unified many of them around a common miraculous event of which they believed they were a part. In the same way, the story of the miraculous deliverance of Yahweh against the evil Egyptian pharaoh 
may have served to bolster confidence and unify the fledgling group known as Israel, forming in the highlands of Canaan, setting them apart from the surrounding people groups. At a minimum, the Exodus ultimately served as a powerful origin story that continues to keep those who identify with it as a unified people, even thousands of years later. And pausing, uh, just letting Maggie know you have five minutes and 30 seconds uh, to finish up. Thank you for all the super chats. I will be taking those during Q&A. When we get to Q&A, you will I'll go in the order of the super chats and address those. So thank you all for the super chats. I just want to add, I think Josh did a really good job of um, summarizing the issues at stake. Um, for me, I think it's important to be respectful of people of faith when we discuss this issue. I, I don't actually know a lot of scholars <clears throat> who don't think that it's interesting to look at what history might underlie uh, the Exodus narratives. And I, um, you know, I think that for something as central to the identity as a pe of a people, you know, the Jewish people as the Exodus, um, it's it's really worth looking at and, and giving a serious critical thought to. Um, but I think it does an injustice to the Hebrew Bible not to try and understand what the text is really about, what it's really saying, what value these stories could have beyond sort of um, trying to find archaeological evidence that doesn't exist for a literal uh, interpretation or a literal understanding of this narrative. You know, I think, you know, as an Egyptologist, I'm mainly here today just to kind of fill in any gaps that I can. You know, if, if anybody has questions or, or, or sort of wants the Egyptological perspective here, I'm, I'm here to give it. Um, but I can tell you from the perspective of an Egyptologist, I have a lot of colleagues who are very interested in this story, who are very interested in the history behind it um, and respectful of um, people's fascination for it, for the importance that it holds in the lives of so many. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to join this conversation. Um, I enjoyed hearing Jonathan and CJ's perspective, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing what questions come up. Thank you so much. Uh, that left four minutes left. I appreciate you relinquishing that time. We'll go ahead and go to opening, uh, like an open conversation slash, if I could call it, cross-examination. The goal will be to be respectful of each other, try not to allow this to get too emotional, um, I will only interject if I feel like uh, it's becoming hogged or there there's some disrespect in terms of communication here. So with that being said, I, I think since you guys just finished your opening, let's allow Jonathan and CJ to start and then we'll go back and forth. I'd like to make this uh, for the next 60 minutes. If you guys um, run out of things to talk about, we'll relinquish that time, get straight to Q&A, super chat your questions, and I will take them during Q&A. Thank you once again. Okay. Yeah, so Dr. Josh, please don't yell at me, uh, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, uh, and, and this is for either Dr. Josh or uh, Dr. Bryson. Um, while you've laid out uh, a, a good case uh, on the absence of evidence uh, in what uh, you're looking at in the uh, early uh, data from the Egyptian records uh, that uh, you wouldn't feel is consistent uh, with the case, what positive uh, data uh, are you making for your case? So where is the positive uh, data to support that this did not happen? And I'll let either one of you respond. Go ahead, Josh. No, no. No, I, was, I was just yeah. going to, to say that, um, Jonathan, I think that we are all in agreement that logically, right, it's, it's a famous logical proposition that you can't prove a negative. There is no logical way to prove a negative, right? The absence of evidence doesn't necessarily mean that something didn't happen. Um, and there isn't, right? There's, there's no amount of non-evidence that you could ever marshal to prove that something absolutely didn't happen. It's just not possible. But if something didn't happen, then no, it wouldn't leave evidence, right? You're left in kind of a, a quandary there. Um, and it's one of the fundamental problems of, of ancient history in particular, where we have problems of preservation to contend with and things like that. Um, for me, the positive evidence lies in what we can say about um, people of Canaanite origin living in Egypt, uh, not only in the, the, the late Bronze Age, but before and after, um, and in the sort of um, facts of Egyptian history as we know them that offer alternative explanations or um, that at least give us an indication that if something of, on the scale of the Exodus as it's described in the Hebrew Bible had happened, we would have some indication either from Egyptian or from other Near Eastern sources. So that's where I come from. 
I'll let Josh take over there. Yeah, and I mean, just sort of from a from a methodological standpoint, I think the the problem that I have with the question um, is that it's not really how historiography is done, right? We don't start with a we don't start with a source, and then say, okay, well, we're going to assume that this is accurate in its details until we can prove all the the things that it says incorrect, right? Um, it's it's far more complicated than that. Like nobody picks up. Um, the many inscriptions that we have from the 24th century uh, about Naram Sin, right? And and this uh, series of nine battles that he fought in one year and then became deified because the people of, of the city of Agade requested of the gods that he be deified. We don't pick up that text and say, all right, now, how can we prove this wrong? That's, that's not really the approach, right? It's taking into account, uh, and to be clear, like I'm a philologist, right? So I'm not a professional historiographer or something. Um, but the, the approach is to, to take the data and to generate a model, right? So um, relying on things like, well, it's possible that X is the case, while absolutely plays a role at certain points. It's sort of a last resort role. And what we don't do um, is, is begin with the conclusion that X ancient text as it stands is true. And now we have to, to figure out a way to make that work, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the, the one uh, follow-up question I would have on that, just from an archeological uh, perspective, uh, so when we're trying to construct an empirical uh, uh, history, don't we begin with the artifact? So if we have a site, uh, so our uh, empirical basis is the site and those artifacts. And then from there, we're, we're building that. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll lay either Dr. Maggie Bryson and Dr. Josh. And yeah, if I, uh, go ahead, Maggie, if you want, if you've got something you want to say. I just wanted to jump in as, as an historian and say that Jonathan and CJ, you're both right that historians, academics often have prejudices. You know, Josh, what Josh is describing is, is the way that we all want to work. We all want to look at texts as objectively as we can. None, nobody wants to come to a text um, with a, a preconceived idea and then try to prove it right or wrong. But I think most people who study history probably um, do so because they have some investment in it emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Uh, at some point in their lives and on some level, you know, and I don't want to speak for everyone. I'm sure there are people who really do just um, have a certain amount of intellectual curiosity and, and get into it that way. Right. But you guys are right that if you look into the backgrounds of a lot of uh, mainstream historians, you'll find that they are bringing perspectives from their own personal or religious uh, experiences. And I think we all do that regardless of which side um, of the debate today you might fall on. And I think it's very fair of you guys to point that out. And I think that it's our responsibility as scholars to acknowledge that fact and to try to compensate for it in our work. And I think most people do. You know, I think most legitimate scholars would would describe what they're doing as trying to get at a truth that it's sometimes difficult to access because we do have these perspectives and we do lack positive evidence in many cases. We're, we're doing our best um, with uh, an imperfect kind of... My apologies. Um, sorry, I, I didn't mean to try and cut you off there. Um, no, I, I wanted to just kind of build off that a little bit because, you know, I, I totally agree that I'm also coming at this with a, with a particular bias as well, right? And if I had a PhD six or 10 years, however long it took me years from now, it wouldn't be any different. I'm still uh, very much, you know, a Christian fundamentalist. That said, though, I feel like I can take my fundamentalist cap off and make a lot of the same arguments that I would make for an exodus. And I, I really want to talk specifically about two things Dr. Josh mentioned. You mentioned the Battle of Mons and Naram Sin, which I think perfectly illustrate uh, the position that I'm coming at here today. I don't, I, I'm willing to grant for sake of argument that Moses never worked a miracle, that prophethood is not real, that there is no God and that the numbers are exaggerated. I, I think all of that can be granted for sake of argument because none of it actually disproves the central claim which is, is there evidence of the people who became the Israelites actually leaving um, from slavery in Egypt 
at a point in time, right? Did that event, the historical exodus, take place? And just to give a really good example, right, um, we have the Battle of Thermopylae, right, which has tons and tons of false facts surrounding it, right? Uh, false facts regarding certain deities, false facts regarding way exaggerated numbers, uh, false facts regarding, you know, I mean, how does anybody know what Leonidas did in his last seconds if everybody was killed, right? That doesn't make any sense. But we know that Thermopylae happened, and we know that Leoni Leonidas existed, and we know that the 300 Spartans did die there. And even though it wasn't a million Persians, it was a really, really large army of Persians, and so on and so forth, right? My point just kind of being that even if we grant a lot of the points that you guys made, let's say the numbers are exaggerated, let's say it's 10,000 or, or even lower, right? That is that actually disprove the central claim here, which is that an event of uh, the, the proto, uh, excuse me, the proto Hebrew people left um, Egypt at a point in time, were led from slavery at a point in the time there, and then came into Canaan via conquest. And I don't think, I think Naram Sin and the Battle of Wands proved very clearly that I don't think it does. Um, if, if the miracle claims aren't true, if the numbers are exaggerated, again, all that other kind of stuff, I'm kind of just repeating myself, but it doesn't actually do anything other than tell us some of the details might be wrong. But the actual historical claim is what I'm personally trying to defend. And so with some of those things, I'm just willing to grant them for sake of argument. Sure. So go ahead, make your case. Because well, if you're going to just, well, hang on. That was sort of rhetorical. Um, because if, if what you're going to marshal is the Hebrew Bible, it's just not that simple, right? You can't, you can't marshal the Hebrew Bible and say that, uh, well, we just we have to start with this is a historical document because that is the debate, right? So, um, well, not not exactly. The debate is the claim, right? Because there's there's multiple documents and multiple documents have evidence of the claim, right? But the debate is the claim itself because you and I actually agree that the document is historically reliable, at least in certain instances, right? So, for example, you would obviously say that when in the Book of Chronicles, right, when we're talking about the kings, that's probably fairly accurate history of the Hebrew kings, right? Not the Chronicles as much as maybe Kings, but okay. Well, well, King Kings works for certain. Either way, one of the books, right? Um, the point just kind of being, we actually do agree that this is at least somewhat historically reliable, both of us, right? So all oh, I'm sure. saying is that it's historical rel historically reliable in uh, this past event, right? Even if certain details could be wrong, and and again, we know uh, from you know other examples like Naramsin, like the Battle of Mons, like the Sumerian Kings list, all these other kinds of things. Um, there is evidence where we discount an awful lot of it, but still recognize that it is evidence of a certain claim, right? We recognize that Gilgamesh should have sure. potentially been a king, well, even but what though is, the Sumerian if, kings if, has thousands if, upon if thousands could, of years at it, right? Yeah, if I, if I could. So what? Yes, there's a fundamental difference, I think, between the claim of the Hebrew Bible about the Exodus uh, and something like Naram Sin, and that is the contemporaneity, contempor contemporaneous nature of the source material, right? Uh, so when we think about something like Naram Sin, if, if we only had copies of stories uh, or of that story from 700 years later, uh, it would be a lot harder. It'd be a lot harder to, and, and if that were all that we had, it'd be a lot harder to say, yeah, we actually think there was probably some battles, right, that Naramsen fought. And even with, even with, um, you know, these, these multiple accounts that we have of Naramsen's battles from the period and the fact that, you know, we have administrative documents that show Naramsen's name changing from, you know, without the divine determinative to, the, you know, having the divine determinative, uh, and something like, you know, having the victory steely of Naram Sin, where he's wearing the horned headdress. Like, even with all of those contemporaneous pieces of archaeological data and textual data, we still don't go, well, what, you know, what, what this, like, Joan Vestenholtz, you know, like when she writes her, she doesn't just, oh, well, this obviously happened, right? It's, it's much more nuanced than that. And I think that's the big thing that, um, you know, I, I think we need to drive home with this, is that there obviously are scholars that would say, very minimalist scholars, uh, that would say, no, it's a complete fabrication from the Persian period or something. But most scholars that that you'll encounter uh, will say, 
Yeah, I mean, they're 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 very well may have been, um, you know, a uh, some 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 real historical background to this, some cultural memory or actual events, right? But the, the problem is that 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 that's not the question. The question is, do we turn to the Hebrew Bible and say, all right, this description as given in the you know, the book of Exodus or in Numbers, like this, remember, this is actually how it was. Well, Josh, I, can I, I say something? Sorry, go Please. Ahead. To get to Jonathan's point about positive evidence too, CJ, you mentioned the conquest. Josh, am I correct in understanding that the conquest is one situation where we do have positive evidence? In other words, that it didn't happen? The yeah, Bible I mean, lays it, out a specific itinerary for the conquest by the Israelites, and we can look at those sites archeologically well, and note I, that to be that fair, I think I could, is not reflected in the record. So I, they don't I apologize, I, I, get a little, I get a little jumpy sometimes, time. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, I, I do want, I don't want to go too deep in that just because I, I personally think that there is a good deal of evidence in the conquest. And I think that could take us away a little bit from the conversation. Um, but I will say like, for example, you just, some of the places you mentioned, you know, Jericho, I, Lachish, and Hatsor. Um, if anybody is interested in looking at, you know, the, the, some of the stuff that the archaeology, the, it's what is it, institutes for Bible, Bible archaeology or something like that. Um, they personally argue, and all of them are PhD Egyptologists and history and historians and stuff like that, right? Um, and they all argue that um, these there's actually very solid evidence for uh, those four towns in particular having. Now, granted, their eye I think is different than your eye. I think there's a disagreement as to what town actually is eye. So that is something that does need to be noted. Uh, for can we pause? Can we pause there, CJ? Pause there for just a second because I think you you've hit upon a a really good point. Why is it a different eye? Yeah, well, so certainly, so, different? and there is an eye that um, is that was originally believed to be the eye, and now there's this dispute, right? And this eye is why, I but, but sorry, I, I really want to camp on this. I really want right? to, so I really want to camp ahead. on this. Why is it now disputed? Right. No, and that's what I was saying. So it, it, this particular eye, the first one, is said to have been abandoned from sometime like 2000 to 1000 BC, um, which is a very large period of time, and obviously would include both possible dates of an exodus. Um, there is obviously some arguments that maintain a biblical exodus as well as the traditional eye. Uh, the one that I think is most popular, although I don't know if anybody actually buys it anymore, is Richard Gabriel used to say that the Bethelites uh, used eye as sort of like a base. Um, but nonetheless, the point just kind of being, I, I fully recognize your, your point there that um, the original... Well, let's not, the let's not move past it, because I, I think it's important, because it kind of goes back to what you something you said earlier in your opening, when you said that academic retreat, right, that that mm -hmm. when scholars find that, oh, you know, this, this, this consensus that we held no longer holds, uh, what's good for the goose, right? Um, and right. like somebody like Bryant Wood from University of Toronto, right, where he got his PhD, um, you know, he's digging it, you know, Maketeer and it, it making, you know, this, this argument that, oh, well, it's not, it's not I, well, there's a reason that he's doing that. Right. And it's not because he went over to this other tell <clears throat> for no reason. Right. It's because I is such a huge problem. And it's the agreed upon site has been for, uh, and, 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 and this is also the case with Jericho, right? And, and let me, I want to say one more thing about this. From a biblical, his, uh, biblical archaeology standpoint, I have a whole chapter on this uh, in, my, in my first book. Um, like biblical archaeology was the opposite of what you're describing in, in, in the sense that this is this was a very uh, in many ways uh, uh, enterprise dedicated to proving the validity of the biblical texts, right? So when people came to these sites, I mean they were coming to these sites, organizations saying the defense of the Bible, right? Well, and I, I know that certainly is true a lot. Like like Bryant Wood, for example, is he would take the same position that I do as far as admittedly calling himself fundamentalist, right? So totally grant some of that. And I think the original German excavation of of uh, of Jericho was also that way. Well, like Garstang, for example, um, John Garstang. I don't know that John Garstang was even a Christian, um, 
let alone he was definitely out going to he was definitely going to defend the biblical text that's why he was digging the chair. right but that's a different thing right like for example there the guy who originally discovered troy the reason the whole reason that he was there in the first place is because he really genuinely believed now he didn't believe in zeus or Ares or anything like that but he really genuinely believed that that story was accurate and he would set out to prove it right and so that's a different thing than saying this person may have had a religious motivation or something like right that. but it's 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 six one half dozen the other in this case right because it's arguing for the biblical the validity of the biblical text yeah but the, Sorry, you gotta understand and, and you would understand this greater than anybody right all of the ancient texts are going to have that problem so, sorry and i will stop here because i've been hogging the conversation but you know, for example, the Sumerian kings list, like I already said, it starts off saying that the, the, the kingship descended from heaven, right? Like all the ancient texts incorporate their religion into their history. It's just like second nature to them almost. So for us to say, well, we kind of kind of discount that because it has the supernatural religious nature. I think we would be um, no, nobody's making that argument. Nobody's making yeah. nobody's making that <laughs> argument. Nobody's yeah. And, and, that just, argument. And, and just uh, um, I was saying uh I know we're getting a lot of really good discussion. Uh, I, I think uh, I do want to kind of circle back to some of the points that I made in my opening. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Maggie alluded or talked about this uh, earlier in terms of, you know, biases or perceptions, uh, which go back to the ancient historians. And while I, I understand there's a, an academic view today, one of the things that I think, you know, we got to look at is uh, the view uh, by some of the uh, most credible uh, historians over a period of, you know, some of the greatest acquisition of knowledge and learning, uh, we're able to look at the data and they come to an opposite conclusion. Uh, I know Tacitus refers, most authors agree, you know, that this was the uh, origin of the Jews we have Strabo, uh, you know, we even have Apian. And if you think about it, he was an Egyptian piece. Uh, he had very clear intentions to discredit uh, the uh, Jewish account. And largely what we get from him is positive for the Jewish exodus. So what I would like to see is, uh, or at least understand, how do you reconcile uh, modern uh, consensus or uh, the worldview of today with historians in a position, as I opened up in my argument, with better access to information that we just do not have today. Jonathan, I, I'm not sure. Are you directing this at me or at Josh, just to be clear? Oh, either, either one, Dr. Josh well, or Dr. Bryson. Let me give you my perspective, which is that I'm not sure I understand your question entirely because there isn't one modern perspective and there wasn't one ancient perspective either, right? Josephus and Apian were at odds. They had access to the same material nominally, but they were at odds about how to interpret it. Josephus had to, right, for starters, Josephus, excuse me, Manetho and Apian, because we're talking about epi epitomes of these texts anyway, right? We don't have all, we don't have Apian's works at all. We don't have all of Manetho. We have the bits of Manetho that Josephus and other authors thought were important because they addressed this or had the potential to address the issue of Israelite history in Egypt. So Manetho, right, talks about the Hyksos. He talks about Canaanites who lived in Egypt who came to rule it and the fact that they were driven out of Egypt by the Egyptians. Josephus turned to that and said, ah, this must be the Exodus, right? Josephus thought that Manetho's account of the Hyksos described the Exodus. Um, but again, I don't think that that's what we're, you know, a modern, right, scholar looking for the historical Exodus would necessarily turn to, right? Because if I understand correctly, right, we're, we're talking in terms of the middle of the 15th century to the around 1400 BC, right? And the Hyksos episode takes place a little before that. Again, this is if we can get that kind of chronological resolution, which isn't certain. Yeah, no. I'm not sure I understand your premise. Well, and that neither modern historians nor ancient historians were really in agreement on how the Egyptian sources spoke to the Exodus tradition. Well, I, I think if we look at the statement, so and what I'm trying to say is the consistent or the material facts of an exodus, uh, of uh, Exodus. You know, so when Tacitus refers that there was a great plague, well, that's consistent with an element in the book of Exodus. When they talk about an expulsion from Egypt because uh, the gods were upset, uh, we have that element, 
We also have the element that, you know, of character of Moses. He was the leader of this group. They went to uh, Judea. Um, and then, you know, the, we see elements of that in Apian, uh, Strabo. And while there are differences, when we look at uh, Manitho, we look at Ape, these elements of the uh, Exodus that is consistent with the book uh, is in their histories. And so what I'm saying is they, uh, Hecatius, he was, he was at Thebes, uh, Ptolemy's opened up all this access to Egyptian uh, records. Diodorus confirms that these records were there. So why are we in a better position today to inspect the Egyptian documentation than these scholars who make pretty clear case of the uh, uh, Jewish exodus? So the, the material facts, they basically agree on. There's some differences which is show that they're independent. So I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're in a better position to inspect the ancient Egyptian sources, but what I am stating pretty categorically is that I don't think that the ancient authors um, were authoritative in saying that the exodus of Israel from Egypt happened as it's described in the Hebrew Bible. The status of Jews in Egypt was, as was the status of a lot of people in Egypt in the Ptolemaic period, a subject of contention. And so they were interested in the history for you know some of the same reasons we are right what does it mean to be jewish what's sh what should the position of a jewish community in a given state be right or any religious minority um and so they looked to the ancient egyptian sources the same way we might and they sure they probably did have better um, access to them but even with that better access they still weren't able to come up with definitive and, and undisputed conclusions about what the exodus even would have been if it had happened much less that it actually did and I don't think anyone, you know, like, the, you know, and obviously, right, things like the idea that there was a plague in the late Bronze Age, a pandemic disease that that affected Egypt, that affected Canaan, that affected the Hittite Empire is clear from plenty of other sources of evidence. We don't have to turn to, to Tacitus to know that there was a plague in the 14th century BC, right? The Temple of Amenhotep III, right, is full of these statues of the plague goddess. There are spells on papyrus from a bit later, but admittedly still there, that talk about the Canaanite illness, right? That talk about a plague of black boils, right? The ebonic plague, in fact, produces um, symptoms like that. So if it was if it was present in the ancient Near East, then yeah, sure, there might have been a plague of black boils. But the sources that we have for that, right? So the plague in the reign of Amenhotep III, then this these spells against Canaanite illness, right? They date to a range of the over they they span a range of time. They don't land at 1450 or 1400 BC or whatever it is that you want to call it, as if there had been a singular instance of plague that could have been wrought upon Egypt by a god, right? There's a plague of the plague of hail, right? There is a tempest stella. Right. There is a an Egyptian stella, you know, composed at the behest of an Egyptian king that describes a massive storm, a bad weather event that, that caused a lot of trouble in Egypt. That dates to maybe around 1550 B.C. Right. Wait. A date that no one posits for an historical exodus. Right. There are there is plenty of Egyptian uh, evidence that speaks to events like this. Right. And of course, there were Canaanite people, Canaanite origin, West Semitic speakers living in Egypt. There may have been Yahweh worshippers living in Egypt in the Bronze Age. But the idea that all of that evidence coalesces around a singular point in time, as we would expect, were the Exodus historical, historical, excuse me, is not supportable. Would you would you agree that from the histories of Tacitus, Theodorus, Hecateus, Strabo, that they all blamed uh, the Jewish people or the foreigners, a uh, large majority of them being uh, the Jews that moved on, were expelled for that reason, which would be another really consistent element with the Exodus case from their perspective. So the, the Hellenistic historians had both an ax to grind and the benefit of historical perspective, right? They had a current, his, current political problem that they wanted to marshal historical evidence to help them solve in, in their own interests. And they could then go back through Egyptian history and cherry pick the sources for information that supported them in the same way that a modern historian might. You know, it's not a, right, Josh, you can speak to this with, you know, you've done a lot of research on the Daniel problem, right? The issue of prophecy in the ancient Near East. When you come to these, when you see these later sources making use of earlier material, right? It, 
you know, the fact that they agree isn't coincidental, right? They're drawing on the same body of, of, of evidence and they're referring to each other, right? They're, they're epitomizing each other, right? They're constantly citing and, and referring to one another. They are telling the same story, but it's not because that story is necessarily true. They're telling the same story because they got there the same way and because they're reading each other. So that would be my perspective. I don't think the Daniel part will help here because I think Jonathan and I are also <laughs> going to disagree on that. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, it's, I agree with you completely. Uh, we had a debate about this several months ago. Uh, and it was the same. Jonathan and I were having the same discussion that you and he are having. Uh, yeah. Because like, you know, when, when Meg, as you're, as you're pointing out, like when, um, you know, references made to Alexander the Great coming uh, to the Jewish high priest and being shown, you know, that, uh, you know, here, here you are, right, in the book of Daniel, um, that that's not, like, there aren't historians that will look at that and say, well, we can, you know, there's a peg that we can, you know, nail that we can drive into the wall and, uh, because there's definitely, as you, as you put it, you know, a, uh, there's motivation, there's commitment, uh, there's a reason that he's utilizing uh, that and that it's you know, part of it is he's utilizing the, the text, right? But um, yeah, I don't think Jonathan's, Jonathan, I don't think you'll, you'll agree on yeah, that. So. And, and I think it just comes down to uh, these Greeks did have biases and, you know, uh, the purpose of picking, you know, Tacitus, uh, Strabo, Theodorus is uh, they were very anti-Jewish in their writings. Uh, so they did not have incentive uh, to go ahead and establish uh, a positive uh, history that would have uh, posed a threat to the Egyptian religion, especially since, you know, money was very important. So, um, you know, they didn't have any incent uh, incentive uh, to propagate a claim that would only be positive for the Jews, their religion. Um, so... You know, when I bring up the dog that didn't bark, that is a huge, um, that's a huge flight. It doesn't say it draws an absolute conclusion, but it uh, it does make us think why they wouldn't have responded, and they did, to this specific issue. Um, well, the, I'm oh, sorry, Jonathan, I apologize oh, for interrupting. Oh, no, no, no. Um, uh, uh, go, go ahead and finish your thought. Uh, I was going to ask you something else, but well, a it is a powerful rhetorical strategy to concede part of your opponent's argument and then use it against them. And I think that any uh, self-respecting apologist would know that. So, if you are an apologist for the ancient Egyptian pagan religion, right, to concede the point that your opponents are making and then to turn that to your own advantage, right, or if you are a Jewish apologist um, in um, a bad position in Egypt, either way, right? Agreeing on the terms of debate and then trying to take what are supposed facts and cast them to your advantage would have been a valid rhetorical strategy for either side. So I don't know that I agree with you that that particular piece of, that that particular argument is, is helpful here. Um, but again, even if we all agree, right, that the ancient historians could see the same thing we're seeing, which is that there were a lot of different things that happened over the course of the Bronze Age that could have played into the Exodus tradition, right? I mean, they, I don't see necessarily how, um, how that speaks to the idea that the Exodus was a big one-time event the way it's portrayed in the text. But anyway, I'm turning it back over. Yeah, and I think it, it, I know Dr. Josh and I have had these discussions and I've talked with CJ about that. It, you know, um, from your perspective, an Egyptologist, uh, what would it mean in the ancient world or for Egypt uh, for a large group? Uh, we don't have to get to a, a 600,000, but I mean, even if I just stick with the historians, Tacitus, Strabo, say there was a large number that was expelled what would have had to happen for the Egyptians to allow its workforce, its, um, its economy basically, uh, to just leave like that? And if the Jewish account that says a mixed multitude went in that, what would have had to happen for a nation like Egypt 
as powerful it was to allow all the slaves to just leave. Um, well, let's be clear. Egypt, from my perspective, did not allow hundreds of thousands of slaves to walk out. No, I and, and I would agree with you from the standpoint that they wouldn't allow it to happen. They didn't. I mean, in point of, because right, the, the Exodus narrative says that whether the Egyptians wanted it or not, hundreds of thousands of people left Egypt at the same time. If that had happened, it would have caused an unprecedented crisis for the Egyptian state. That's pretty, you know, the the, the that's a big chunk of the actual population of Egypt as a whole at that time. I mean, it would have been, you know, again, population estimates for the ancient world are, are subject to debate, but we're not, we're talking about single digit millions at the very most for the entire population of Egypt. If the Israelites in the numbers that the Exodus text specifies had left Egypt at once, it would have wreaked havoc on the political economy of the entire ancient Near East. Right? And, and if I, such a big deal. I just I want to make sure we're all like on the same page here. Um, so you know, if you go to Exodus twelve, uh, you know, the, 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 where this comes from is you know twelve thirty seven talks about six hundred thousand fighting men, right, men on foot. Uh, so you know, when you factor in women and children, you know, the 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 general estimate that people that scholars are coming up to is between two and a half three million people, somewhere around there, and that's a little conservative. Well, you know, Dr. Bryson can speak to it, but I mean, there's what, two and a half to three million people in all of New Kingdom Egypt, right? So in in, in the entirety of it. So um, now whether whether one wants to make an argument that the word, the Hebrew word Aleph there doesn't mean thousand, that it means like a military unit, um, you know, or like, for, first of all, there's a reason that we're now making that argument. And if you're talking about academic uh, retreat, there's another example of it. Right, because everybody has translated LF just as it's I think is supposed to be translated, and that is thousand. Just like um, to state for the record, but, I actually agree with that. Oh, I know, I know you do, I know you do. Uh, but so not, not you. Um, and I think actually the biblical narrative, in a lot of ways, at least in its canonical form, requires this massive horde. Right? I mean, you think about the oracles of Balaam, and you think about that story, and they're they're they're, they're licking up the ground right o opposite Jericho. Um, you know, Moses making the comment, like, how if we slaughter all the animals and get every fish out, all the fish of the sea, how will we feed, you know, these people? And then, of course, you have the censuses in the book of Numbers that are 603,550 people. I think that's the right number. And then it's a little less than that, you know, what, 38 years later. Anyway, the point is that those are the numbers that, you know, that, that we're dealing with. And so if that's the case, um, you know, like Dr. Bryson is spot on here, like havoc. I mean, it's, it's, and, and the other thing to remember here is depending on when you want this to happen, you're either doing this, in either case, you're doing it in a period where Egypt has firm control on Canaan. I mean, it, it, I don't, I don't think we should overlook that. You know, the, these Israelites are escaping to another part of Egypt for all intents and purposes. Right? Well, That's sort it. of, though, right? Because many, many historians have pointed out that the Egyptian control over the Judean highlands, which is everything they would have before the United Monarchy, is weak at best. That's because um, there wasn't anybody up there. Well, that's the claim, right? But there is certainly <clears throat> evidence that there was people up there. For example, Jericho is the oldest inhabited city in world history, and that's in the Judean highlands, right? So there is certainly evidence that some people were there. Jerusalem also, we have the Amarna tablets talking about Jerusalem, right? which a lot of people say is probably um, Jerusalem. In fact, it sounds very much like the Hebrew pronunciation of it, Yerushalayim. Sure, but these are Canaanite um, cities. But, these are Canaanite well, cities. The, the point that I'm just trying to make, though, is that we, we do have, right, so there's, a, I know there's a lot of disputing claims, that, in other words, that like me and you would disagree on a lot of the, uh, the conclusions here. But the point is just that when we talk about Egyptian control over the Judean highlands, that's not really very firmly, in fact, Thutmose III is going up there to Megiddo precisely because of that, right? Uh, at least if we, if we are, uh, if we have because a proper of understanding of his conquest there, at least. Um, yeah. And so the point they're just kind of being that, you know, when we talk about Egyptian domination in this area, I think that's kind of overblown. 
Um, we know that this was a border area. We know that it was not as, well, as it wasn't a border um, area, CJ. It was a well, well like it was a province, right? State. I mean, they, 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 it's it's made up of 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 three different uh, areas, right? Uh, Amuru, what Upu, and and Canaan, right? I mean, it's it's not like it's a it's a area out there that's sort of on the you know like something that that the Assyrians would have had you know maybe tentative control over. I mean, it's. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Josh. I just, you know, again, I, I feel like I really should jump in here because even if we concede, and there, and it's possible that there was an Egyptian revanchment in Canaan overall, not just in the highlands, right, but in the lowland area, of coastal area as well, around 1400 BC, right, in the reign of Amenhotep the the second, right, thereabouts, right, through the Amarna period, is that you know, we concede, right, that that a concede is not the right word. We believe that that likely happened. The Egyptians were not necessarily as soundly in control throughout the entirety sure. of the late Bronze sure. Age. Of, and Josh, you know that as well as I do. Um, but in point of fact, right, for starters, the, the, if I'm, Josh, am I right that the Exodus narrative includes coastal cities? It's not just, the or conquest, excuse me, includes coastal cities. It's not confined to the highlands entirely. I mean, it's, it's, I it's mostly central than southern than northern, but. Okay. But again, so it, this is something that does kind of you know, reach to all of those geographic regions. And second, right, again, we're talking about, you know, a third of the population of Egypt as a whole. That many people on the move is something we expect to leave a mark. Well, yeah, well yeah. I would, I, and I, I, I would uh, yeah, let me just. Uh, I'm so uh, sorry. I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have to go change a diaper. I'll be right back. Please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't no, say no anything problem. interesting about me. No, no problem. Um, the one thing, Dr. Josh, and I think it just comes back, you know, to, you know, what would it have taken? Um, and, you know, we do see in the historical accounts, or at least in uh, the Hellenistic and Roman histories, this great plague, this uh, expulsion, the Jews were blamed for it. So they're looking at it from their perspective. But at that point, that we do have that empirical data, uh, regardless of what we may think of what their sources or what their motivations for saying it. Um, when do we begin to engage the black swan that, Hey, uh, what, uh, the Jewish narrative is saying. And, and I mean, as a, you know, a seriologist, I mean, I, I do tie this event back to, you know, what happens outside of Jerusalem, you know, when the large Assyrian army, we, we have, you know, an observable black swan here. Uh, and are we willing to engage it uh, outside our naturalistic framework when it calls for it? And, and, yes. and, that's all, and that's all I'm asking is when do we start to engage that question instead of I want I want to try to fit it into my natural I'm not saying that you are, but sure when, when do we start breaking out of that mold and start saying this is what it would have meant for that let to me happen? let me come at it from the other direction to answer the question because what you're describing is the last you know 200 years, right? Um, when you think about biblical archaeology, the history of biblical archaeology is this pursuit of assuming the validity, the historical validity of the biblical text and the stories that are in it, and then going to substantiate it, right? Where do we dig? I mean, you know, I've said it before, and certainly, well, certainly not my saying, uh, you know, digging with the, the Bible in one hand and the spade in the other. Can I kind of push back on that a little bit, though? Because I, I know there is some truth to that. I certainly understand. Like Henry Rollison, for example, is considered the first Assyriologist, and he had a, a very serious conviction that the Bible was at least historically accurate, right? And I get a lot of that. But it is also true. I mean, you would certainly concede that before 1906, it was universally attested. The Hittites did not exist. The Bible is a fairy tale. Uh, before 1842, universally attested. Nineveh does not exist. The Bible is a fairy tale. Uh, before the, I can't remember the exact date it was dug up, but before we got the Taldan Stele, the House of David didn't exist. The Bible is, you know what I mean? So while it is true in one end that certain people were there trying to prove the narrative, it's also true that the academic consensus has always had a vendetta. Well, I strongly disagree. Um, so 
I mean, isolating certain aspects. So, for example, any fundamentalist evangelical would say that William, you know, Albright was a liberal, right? But I mean, he argued for the basic historical validity of the text, right? Um, and so this isn't a question of theological commitments. I think that's a separate issue. Um, what I'm what I'm describing, and, and I mean, often, very often, there were theological commitments that 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 came in, right? But on the whole, what I'm saying is that uh, what Jonathan is saying is that, like, starting with this idea, um, like, at what point do we say, all right, we're we're gonna, if if I heard you correctly, Jonathan, at what point are we gonna say, let's take it as it stands <coughs> and engage with it in that way? That's oh, oh, what biblical. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah. And I, and I would just say, and you're right, I would say when it warrants, I, I, I'm not sure, against sure. the naturalistic model. In most cases, this is what we're going to expect to find. But I, I would equate what happened in the Exodus for, as Dr. Uh, Bryson was saying, you know, yeah, they, they wouldn't have allowed that to happen. But, you know, we do have a lot of reports that it did. So what best explains... Uh, that expulsion, if it's not consistent with where it makes us step outside our naturalistic framework and start to say there may be some validity in this because for that to have happened, because it would have destroyed their economy, they wouldn't have let their workforce go like that. And then, you know, I, I am trying to grab the empirical data, whether, you know, it's from the Hellenistic periods to Roman periods. They did identify core elements, which then makes me ask, what would it allow the Egyptians to do that? Uh, yeah, and I think this is why I say, how did we get where we are, right? In this in this debate, like how did it get here? Um, so James Hofmeyer, for example, I think this is a really good example of this, a brilliant Egyptologist. Um, and I think it's in his 2005 publication, but he's talking about this number of you know the 600,000 and he makes the argument that it means a military unit that LF there means a military unit but when he when he opens up about why uh he says well <clears throat> like we know now archaeologically and I'm paraphrasing but now we know archaeologically and historically that 600,000 fighting men doesn't work so we have to look for another explanation see for me uh th th what you're describing is where we've come from, right? People people coming at this and other biblical stories from that perspective. And the reason that we're where we are today is because people excavated at Jericho, people excavated at Heshbon, people excavated at Dibon, people excavated at Arad, and they went, uh, okay, well, this doesn't fit, right? And... And so now the interpretive model has to shift. This is why, I think this is why we are where we are. So I don't think it's a question of, well, we want it to fit naturalistic means or something like that. It's what model best accounts for the data. And if you have later data, and I'm in no way an expert on Greek and Roman historians, so I'm the last person you should ask about that. But when you have later data like that, and you compare it to the archaeological data as it stands. Oh, my God, that's adorable. Um, I'm just not going to look at your screen right now, I guess, because I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, you know, now you have to you have to come up with this adjusted model. It's the reason that we're in a mainstream position of the 13th century. If there's historical reliability, if there's historical you know, background at all to the Exodus, that it's gotta be a 13th century thing, right? That's why that's the mainstream position. It's because the 15th century became untenable, so. See, and, and I just wanna point out, I, there's a, a large deal of agreement that I have with what you just said, because like, like, for example, the Aleph thing. I mean, is it possible? Yes, but that's definitely not what it means. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I agree. And so I, I hear a lot of what you're saying. Where I'm coming from though, I get, and it's, don't get me wrong, I know this is a little different than the line of questioning that, that uh, Mr. Trevor was just asking, so I'm not going to pretend you weren't answering me or anything. Um, it's because, you know, this is a different line of 
questioning. But where, where I'm personally coming from here is like, it, I feel like if I were an atheist, I could make the exact same arguments I'm making right now, right? Because I, we do this with so many other sources um, all the time, right? Like dude, like the A Million Man Army and Herodotus's histories, is just, nobody believes that. I don't know a single historian on the planet who would say a million Persians showed up at Thermopylae and attacked. But also a lot of what Herodotus says is definitely taken to be true um, because he was at least a semi-decent historian. Right. And, and he has uh, the ability to know what he's talking about, at least so we assume is, and I guess we wouldn't say assume. So evidence suggests. Right. Um, and my only point, I guess, in saying that is if we do go that far. Right. If we do grant, let's say Moses is not miraculous at all. Um, let's say that the numbers are very clearly exaggerated. And let's say if there was natural disaster, it was natural at best if it existed at all. Um do we st is it still true for us to say there is good reason to believe that a large number large meaning in the thousands not hundreds of thousands right um that a large number of semitic slaves who we might consider to be proto-hebrew right. left egypt uh around the 15th to 13th century i'd personally take the 15th century date uh and i think there definitely is right we do know they were there uh we have large numbers of semites in the goshen region uh, and then we do know that they left at some point. We don't really know why or how, but there's conflicting theories. At least partially, we know that the Hyksos were driven out, but that's not all the Semites. It's just some of them, right? Um, but we don't exactly know how. We know that they were there. We know that they left. We know a lot of them were slaves. Like we have slave lists that include Hebrew names like Asherah and Yaqabah and, and Dawid and stuff like that, right? Um, so do we have re reason to believe that that minimalist version of an exodus occurred? I, I think we definitely do. And I think the, the ways I'm concluding that are no different than the ways I would conclude Thermopylae happened, Gilgamesh was a king, the Trojan War really happened, right? Even though I don't grant that the kingship design, uh, descended from heaven or there's a million Persians who showed up uh, or that um, Achilles actually was dipped into the river Styx or anything like that. You know what I mean? And so I sure. guess. So let, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's take the Gilgamesh example because we're, that's something that I can comment on. Right. Um, without feeling like I'm leaving my area of expertise, uh, which is not something I want to do. Um, if we if we use that analogy, it's absolutely true uh, that I think that Gilgamesh was a real king of Uruk, uh, you know, in the mid third millennium. But I think the analogy would then extend, at least in this debate, it would then extend to all right, how much of the epic of Gilgamesh can we prove to be true? And I just don't, I, I don't think it follows, right? I don't think it follows that if he was an actual king, that then we have to look for the like historical kernels of something like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Sumerian, you know, individual stories that built up around him. Um, See, I'd could say some I partially agree. Uh, and let me just explain, because I think you're definitely right in the sense that, um, and just to give an example that everyone knows of, right, George Washington did not cut down a, a cherry tree. It's a myth. It didn't happen, right? So I certainly hear you there. Um, I, I think the kernel of truth might be um, Gilgamesh was a, was a ruler who was legendary in nature, who did something, potentially something in a natural disaster, um, given the epic of Gilgamesh has to do with a deluge that caused him to be remembered in such a way that people were writing legends about him. Even if that's as far as you go, that's still a decent amount of evidence, right? That's still it, like, it gives us an idea. Maybe we can expect a flood to be around his time or some other kind of natural disaster. We can expect potentially if we get more evidence to see uh, maybe other legends about him, because it appears that he very much left an impression on the Sumerian people. You know what I mean? And, and so there is still a lot of evidence we could deduce from that. And, and if I were to just keep my skeptic cap on, I can grant that it doesn't follow the Exodus may have happened, therefore, or even Moses may have existed or anything like that. Therefore, we have to take the Torah whole hog. I'll totally grant that. And I'd even say that's a different argument, right? Um, we could come here and have a different debate on the subject. You know, are the numbers of the Exodus accurate or was Moses a prophet of God or something along those lines, right? Um, but as far as just the, the bare minimalist claim, um, you know, you, you said that you do think there's probably good evidence to believe Gilgamesh was a real king of Uruk. And I'd say as I, I, that's all, as far as I'm going in this debate is that I think there is good mm -hmm. evidence that Semitic slaves left in a semi-decent large number, large for the time, right? 
uh, and went into Exodus, and that's uh, and went to Israel, excuse me, and that's what we could define as the historical uh, Exodus. So um, let me yeah, let, let me say let me say this. So I, I think we've got to be careful about um, distinguishing between what verisimilitude in the story suggests, and I'm really sorry, that's my three year old, um, and how far we can how far we can push that into the story. And what I mean by that is like, you know, Dr. Bryson can speak to this. Uh, you, you, you know, we have um, Anastasia Papyri that from the new kingdom, right. That, that talk about uh, whether they're school texts and how much, you know, that, that pulls from their validity or, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaks to their validity or not from a, I think it, it probably, if it's anything like what we see in, in a Sumerian text, that it, it probably does reflect some sort of, maybe some sort of practice. Uh, but at any rate, if you have something like, you know, Papyrus Anastasi, what, five or six, I always mix them up, uh, where it talks about two slaves that probably Canaanite slaves um, are escaping from Egypt. And on their way out, they're taking a path that's very similar, it seems, on its face to maybe what the Israelites did. And they're being chased and they're being tracked and there's border crossing and like for two, Right. Uh, that sort of thing is, it's like, it's, it's evidence that we want to use to say this gives some verisimilitude that slaves did escape, it would seem, it seems very likely that they did. But then we also have to factor in that there's only two of them and they're being pretty, pretty clearly tracked, right? Because following the Hyksos, uh, and again, Egyptian history is not my thing, uh, but it seems like there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, control on the border, and so, you know, those are the things that I have to I think we have to factor in if we're thinking about this and I'll stop. But if we, you know, if we're thinking about this from like a criminal investigation standpoint, which, you know, I think is one way to come at this, we want to think in terms of like means, motive and opportunity. So when I think about things like the Exodus, if we have two of the three, but they don't have an opportunity or we, you know, they're supposed to be at Kadesh Barnea for 38 years, and there's no, there's nothing, maybe some 12th century shirts, maybe, but there's nothing there, no, no architecture at all before what the 10th century. It's like, um, those are problematic things for a massive group of people. And once you start saying, well, how far down can we scale it? Well, that's fine. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that, but now what we're doing is we're walking away from the narrative of the biblical text and you know, that well but to be that, fair i think the reason that i have to do that is because it's it, you know it's we first have to agree that the exodus happened before we can dis, debut uh, excuse me dispute i said debut no, that doesn't make any sense um before we can dispute some of the uh details of it right uh and other and, and to just give a perfect example of that let's say i wanted to make the case that achilles existed um, which, just to be fair, I, I think it's likely he probably was a military general from the Mycenaean Empire. But regardless, right? Um, if I wanted to make that case, I'd, I'd think it'd be probably, it would behoove me to prove that the Mycenaeans existed first or that the Trojan War happened first. You know what I mean? Um, and then, and when I'm doing that, I may want to grant certain details. Like I'm not saying Achilles, the Achilles excuse me, uh, existed per se. I'm just simply saying that, you know, this particular historical event took place. And so I'm not, you know, walking away from the biblical narrative in the sense that I don't believe it. I'm simply saying that I feel like there's no use in us disputing some of the details like did 600,000 leave versus 10,000 if we don't even agree that a large group left ever. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, and so, oh, go sorry, ahead, Maggie. Dr. Bryson. And I'm sorry. I just wanted to to jump in here because I think it I think, CJ, you've made an important point, which is that we have to define an exodus, what we you know, if we don't agree on what we mean by the exodus, right, then we're, it's going to be very hard for us to have a conversation about whether it happened. You know, it's it's very likely that a number of, of very small exoduses of Canaanite slaves happened, right? The Egyptians were, were very concerned about border control throughout their history, really, throughout the Bronze Age on their northeastern frontier. It was something that they, they had, you know, they had dedicated border police forces in various periods because people were always coming and going from Egypt, right? The patriarchal narratives about, you know, Abraham coming down in times of famine, right? People from Canaan came to Egypt all the time and they left. A lot of times they were enslaved in Egypt and they escaped, they got loose. Um, so the idea that, you know, 
this sort of thing happened repeatedly is, I think, very tenable. But if we want to talk about Exodus as a singular event, then, then that's the terms we need to, to debate under or to talk about. Well, and that's why I would say a... I, I, I would say... Oh, sorry. Uh, and, and, and that's why I'm saying we are talking about, um, you know, and, uh, you know, part of the case that I, and I see Derek coming on, just give me one last minute, Derek. Uh, but, you know, what we're advocating for, for an exodus is uh, a single event in history. Uh, we are advocating, uh, you know, from the narrative that for some reason, the Egyptians were spooked. Uh, they felt it was coming from the gods, and they believed these foreigners, a majority that made up uh, the, um, the the state of Israel, what it would be the state of Israel, are to blame for it. And because something spooked them to that magnitude, not only did we have uh, a large number of Jewish people leaving under the command of uh, a historical figure, Moses, but it also spooked uh, a number of Egyptians to follow in their lead. Uh, so we are talking about a major event that would have necessitated that big F, uh, exit. We're not talking about little numbers. Uh, we, we are talking about the big event. Um, and that's what we were trying to at least establish. We do want to define uh, but we're not talking about little excesses or people running away. We're talking something that would make such a big impact. It we uh, we can see why the ancients in their histories would talk about it and how something like that could be embarrassing. So with that, I will be quiet and turn it over to Derek, my buddy, and we can begin Q and A. Thank you, thank you. A hey, wonderful job, everybody. Even through the children, I could hear Oliver. Uh, Maggie's changing diapers while debating. I mean, can you imagine what a mother, right? So uh, thank you all for being cordial and respectful and insightful in the way that you guys were interacting with one another. I really appreciate that. We're going to go to the Q&A se session. I really appreciate all the super chats. They really go a long way in helping us do what we do. And I'm going to start at the top, work my way down. As super chats come in, I won't be uh, saying thank you for the super chat and chatting because I'm reading them and I'm scrolling down from the top, working down to the bottom. And our first super chat is from Aramgard. And I don't know, this might be addressed to certain people and not everybody. So, uh, you know, we'll try and tackle these. There's many to come to. So thoughts on Exodus 15 is a rework of the ball cycle. Yahweh defeats Egypt with the sea, Yam, and underworld Mot, and has a temple built in his honor. Don't know, that might be a Dr. Josh question. And I have noticed, just to make one quick uh, jab, I, I wanted to say CJ seems to be the Fox kind of guy like me, where we just explore different things. So he's the Christian who sees things like this that most of the time you don't hear other Christians say. But anyway, if you have a comment, feel free, of course. But I think Dr. Josh might be one for this. Thank you. You want me to comment Yeah, if on? you don't mind. So, yeah, I mean, that type of intertextuality uh you know, it's it's a whole it's a whole subdiscipline, right? Trying to to piece those things together. Uh, I haven't looked at the secondary literature on the Song of the Sea specifically to look at the connections there, but that's something that would take looking back through the Ugaritic text uh, and then looking back specifically at the the Hebrew there and seeing if there are echoes or allusions. And there's ab it's, I mean, it's absolutely true that chaos comp uh, this idea that you know you have uh, chaos being fought back and often in these types of, um, you know, oh boy, that's putting me big up on the screen. Um, you know, these types of mythological uh, aspects coming in. There's, there's absolutely true that in Exodus 15, you have this, um, this sort of mythological battle uh, that's taking place. But, you know, as far as what sort of specific connections, I, I'd, ha I'd have to do a lot of reading to, to, to make that sort of argument. Uh, whether it's a reworking, like I my, my, I tend to think no, just off the cuff, uh, because reworking to me has a very specific meaning to it. Uh, but could it be pulling from, you know, I, that, that the general chaos comp, um, you know, theme? Yes, I, that's absolutely the case. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone else want to make a comment on that one? I'd just like to very briefly say, um, I it, 
I, I don't believe this, but if I were to make an argument that there was a reworking of the bail cycle, I don't think I would use Exodus 15. Uh, 15. I think I'd probably go either to Job with the Leviathan um, or, or maybe Daniel 7. Um, but I don't, I don't think Exodus 15 would be a reworking of the bail cycle. Although it does have the mo and there is a common motif, right, of ancient Near Eastern gods fighting with the, uh, the ocean, right, or the sea. Um, so in a very general sense, I guess you could say there's the, the motif there, but, um, that would be being very generous, I think, to the position even still. D Dr. Bryson, were you going to make a comment? I was just going to say that, um, there, the story, stories about Yom, uh, the God and fights with Yom were, were, um, known and, and written down in Egypt in the late Bronze Age, right? There's the famous story of the goddess Astarte and the sea and Yom. Um, but there are actually a lot of really interesting literary interconnections between Egyptian religious and uh, mythical and literary traditions in the Exodus story, specifically the plagues. It's really funny. You can almost track sort of one-to-one -one, um, ideas and themes from Egyptian literature that would have been present in those stories. So um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that too at some point if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, jump into the next super chat. My friend, Caleb Jackson, he says, is Manitho cited by Josephus, a credible Egyptian source for an Exodus like event? So and, and I'll jump in first. So, you know, once again, I, I think it, it does go to opportunity. Uh, what he had available to at the time. Now, uh, Josephus, who is uh, making his case and remember a lot of the Greeks, you know, ask for, you know, a history on the Jews. Romans are trying to better understand them. And, you know, obviously Josephus' strategy, uh, you know, is to defend, you know, what he feels like has been attacking the sacred tradition of the Jews. So, you know, Josephus does do a good job with his quotations of uh, Manetho in the sense that he said, okay, well, here's my source. I uh, obviously, I, I, I can't read the Egyptian sources, but I do have a native born uh, Egyptian who was very uh, fluent in the Greek uh, learning. Uh, he says in Manetho's work that uh, he translated from the native records. And if we tie that back to uh, the, Potom the Potomac uh, uh, area he was living in, you know, there's the Greek conquest, uh, the Ptolemies are open up all this data the egyptian priests were still there the temples were still there uh, a lot more that we didn't have uh, there's the library of alexandria all this learning coming in all these scholars coming in uh so uh i would say he is credible he he is an egyptian he is gonna give it from his standpoint um so i to discredit him you know, there was an opportunity. He was well quoted in there. Uh, so the, the question I, I have to ask is, you know, why wasn't he attacked more? Josephus felt that he supported uh, the elements, uh, material facts in the Exodus narrative to justify their antiquity. He says he had the native records. And uh, unless there's some disagreement, that period opened up a wealth of the Egyptian archives to not only the Greek uh, scholars coming into the area, but as an Egyptian priest, uh, he would have that information as well. And I, uh, I don't know, Dr. Uh, Bryson, if you want to comment on that, uh, since Manitho may be in uh, your area of expertise. Well, I can certainly um, speak to the way that Egyptologists regard Manitho, which is to say that um, you know, again, it's a real pity that we don't have Manitho's original work. The Egyptians in all periods were conscious of their own history. They looked to earlier records um, as a source of uh, religious inspiration or authority. Um, and they looked to earlier records as a source of um, sort of knowledge about the, the way the world should work as a source of credibility. Various kings right, might refer to, to the works of earlier kings as a way to kind of cement their own authority, right? associate themselves with earlier rulers. You know, that there was a one of the sons of Ramses II is always called the first Egyptologist because, you know, he actually sort of sponsored digs at Giza. He excavated, a, he had excavations at Giza and, um, you know, put his name on er, old kingdom statues that he had dug up because he was curious about the past. Uh, the Egyptians 
believed that the world was created in a moment called the, the first moment, right? The first instance, and they wanted to know what things were like then. So they were always trying the same way we are to get back to ever deeper history. Um, so Manitho, as an Egyptian priest, would likely have been, um, again, right, what we mean by accurate is, is I don't want to just sort of, you know, throw in with Manitho entirely, because in terms of things like his chronology, right, so the number of years he attributes to various kings, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of problems with that text. But if Josephus is faithfully excerpting Manitho, then we can be fairly confident that there is a kernel, that there is historical uh, meat to those stories. And in fact, there are archeological um, and sort of, you know, our historical and historical indications that a lot of the stories that Manitho is reported by Josephus to have told um, or to have written were, were fairly faithful accounts of Egyptian history. Again, I think the key thing, Caleb, about your question is that you say Exodus-like event, right? And Josephus is doing the same thing we are doing. He's mining Egyptian sources for anything that could be relevant to the Jewish tradition. And so, yes, absolutely. There are things that happened in ancient Egypt that could have that historical kernel that the people who were compiling the Exodus narrative drew on. Okay, so real quick, I just want everyone to know we have many, many super chats. I'll try to work through them as, as best we can to get the topics addressed from you. So um, I don't want to push us because we have to you know, address them. But I wanted to let you know we have many in mind. So if we can get right to whatever the answer might be, that'd be good for both sides. Um, just let's just keep the move, uh, keep moving because there's so many of them. Uh, RN, thank you so much for the super chat. The battles of Megiddo, Kadesh, Karshemesh uh, were in 1457, 1274, and 605 BCE, Egyptian part. No mention in Judges. Egypt remained active. Uh, HO to fingers crossed with Exodus. I, I'm not really sure, but. Like how to reconcile with the Exodus, I think, probably is the idea. Okay. Yeah, I mean, like there was a recent uh, lecture series interview that Israel Finkelstein did um, down at the uh, Albright Institute, I think. That's where he's at, but. Um, yeah, I mean, he he brings this up quite a bit when he talks about it. Is like, you know, the biblical texts don't <clears throat> seem to know that Egypt was in charge of Canaan, right? It's uh, it's it seems sort of foreign to the text. Like, there's no there's no memory of Egypt being so firmly in charge of Canaan. So, uh, yeah, I mean, these are, I think these are problematic things. Yeah, I would say it is interesting, certainly, that it's not mentioned, especially since by my reckoning of the chronology, I, I think the Battle of Megiddo should have happened. Actually, Megiddo and Kadesh, I think, should have probably have happened during the period of the judges. And I'll admit that's rather strange. Um, there are two things that I would say. Uh, well, I guess Megiddo might be a little bit before the period of the judges, but Kadesh definitely would be in the period of the judges. I'd have to look back at the exact date of Megiddo is because I'm not really remembering. Perhaps somebody can remind me of that. Um, at any rate, I know it was almost the third. At any rate, um, what I would say about that is, number one, I don't think that the um, it, it, I don't think it would necessarily be a problem if the Israelites were not necessarily in conflict with Egypt. In other words, if Egypt is not going there to fight Israel, it could be just an army passing through to go take on some of the rebellious Canaanite tribes that have nothing to do with the Hebrews. Um I think the area has evidence enough that it was disunified, that that such a thing could be the case. Even the Hebrews themselves were disunified. So they could be attacking ones and not attacking others. And because of that, a certain history, if it's told from the perspective of a certain group of people, just may not find the event relevant because it's not relevant to their history in particular. Um, another thing that I think would be interesting to note is we don't have um, really, I guess, complete evidence of the... Um, Egyptian chronology, right? And I want to be very careful here because I'm not by any means an expert on this, but I just know that, you know, there is the, there's a low chronology, a high chronology, and a new chronology, as well as other different chronologies, right? And my only point in even bringing that up is just to say that each of those is going to give you a different pharaoh and a different historical context for what's actually happening at these particular times, even if only by a slightly slight amount of time. Uh, Amenhotep, or Thutmose, or um, I forget, Dudamos, right, are three different pharaohs of the Exodus based off of the three chronologies that I just mentioned, right? My only point in saying that is just simply to say it could be that Megiddo and Kadesh are actually in such a period that it works um, with the biblical chronology, and we just don't, we simply don't know enough to reconcile those things yet. 
Uh, I, I fully recognize that speculation, but I do think that it's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody commented on that one. All right, moving on. Topic discussed, my friend Gary. Thank you for the super sticker. Really appreciate the help, Gary. Uh, go subscribe to his channel too. He has a whole other channel talking about all sorts of topics. So there's my plug for you, man. Thank you so much once again for the support. I appreciate it. Kirk Keys, I hope I'm saying your name correctly there. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, do the Sea Peoples fit into the Exodus story in any way? Well, so they wouldn't one way, right? Which is that the Philistine question, um, are the Philistines actually there when the Exodus happens? Um, but other than that, I don't know how. I'm sure that Dr. Bryson, you could probably give more on that than I definitely could. I can jump in here um, and say that there are a couple of ways in which they do. First, as CJ mentions, right, the, the question of when the Philistines actually were present in Canaan is relevant there, right? The Philistines come from the Palisade. Uh, is the idea, right? One of these groups of people that um, settled on the Canaanite coast after spending some time at sea as marauders. Um, but the way that the Sea Peoples usually come into the debate is when we talk about when the Exodus happened, right? There are sort of two points in time where the Exodus might have happened. One is around 1400 BC, 1450 BC, and one is around 1200 BC. Well, that question of the conquest, right, of Israel invading Canaan and, and laying waste to these Canaanite cities. Archaeologists look for destruction levels to support that story. They look for evidence that an army attacked a Canaanite city. Um, if we date the conquest of Israel, or conquest of Canaan by the Israelites to around 1200 BC, we would expect to find destruction levels in Canaanite cities that date to around 1200 BC. We do in some cases, but that's also the moment when the Sea Peoples were attacking coastal cities throughout the Mediterranean. So if you find a destruction level at a city in 1200, around 1200 BC, there's chances are, it's almost certain, right, that this is a Sea People's attack, not an Israelite attack, right? I guess is sort of the, the archaeological perspective. Josh, correct me. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is what makes this so complicated, right? Because when you, Eric Klein has written very recently an updated edition of his book, 1177, there, there's so much going on in the decline of the Levant uh, and, you know, the, the rest of the Mediterranean. Um, and it's, it's certainly not my area of expertise. But, uh, you know, so, so, so looking at these sorts of things becomes incredibly complex, which is why when you look at a site like Hatsor, there's a reason that they kind of have to go through the different steps. Okay, who could have done this? Could this have been the Sea Peoples? Could this have been you know, another Canaanite city? Could this have been something done by themselves? Could have been the Egyptians, right? And um, I think that the the Sea Peoples, the reason that uh, it Ben Tor, I can't remember if it was Emory Yadin, but um, said that no, he didn't think it was the Sea Peoples because it's too far inland for that to be interesting to them. It's like, eh, is it though? But, um, but, but that's the reason that you have to contend with that is because there's, there, there's, it's so much more complex, that, and this is why historiography of this period is very difficult because we, we, we don't have, for the Israelites, we have so, so little, right? Got the Merneth the Stila. Um, so it's difficult. Really well put, Josh. Derek, you're on mute. Good reminder. Uh, I, I muted just in case, uh, so that way you don't hear any background noise. A little siren was coming by. Uh, moving to the next Super Chat, topic discuss. Gary again, thank you for the Super Chat. He says, Dr. Josh cleans up quite well. <laughs> GQ man of the year. Right? <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, let's continue on. Queen of the Heathen says, uh, and thank you for the Super Chat. Why are Dr. Josh and Dr. Bryson so good looking? <laughs> This is very important for my research. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Once again, Gary's back with another super chat. He says, Dr. Josh and Dr. Maggie, professional, articulate, intelligent, respectful, and looking smoking hot. I think that's what they mean to say. I, I told you we were going to lose the uh, <laughs> uh, the attraction contest. Uh, well, CJ is wearing a, t a tie, so like he, sh he is competing I, in some sense. So Yeah, I, I tried to at least put on a... My wife said I can't look crazy when I come on these things. So I 
Thank you so much for those super chats. I appreciate the compliments, of course, to the guest. Converse Contender, thank you for the super chat. He says, Dr. J and Dr. B, can you explain why scholarship is important when discussing biblical issues? Asking for a friend, laugh out loud. Also glad to see all cordial. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, th I think this was probably uh, more, more at me. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons that you'll, you'll hear uh scholars when they when they academics when they talk about a topic if they haven't written their like their dissertation or they haven't done an independent project or something on it um one of the reasons that we start off with things like look the majority of scholars that are in this field argue x people like to jump down scholars throats for saying stuff like that well who cares what the consensus says well you should um and the reason that you should is not that it's necessarily right um, or that it's infallible or something. But there's a fucking good reason that they're saying it. Sorry. But, I mean, I feel like that deserves an expletive there. There's a reason that all these scholars are getting together and saying, this is what we think about this. Um, so I'll take something that's not on the table today. Like, when I talk about slavery in the Hebrew Bible, that the reason that you, you, the reason that you talk about what scholars say about this is because it's it's everybody that's saying it. It's not just, you know, liberal scholars or fundamentalist scholars or conservative scholars or whatever. It's scholars, this is what the consensus position is. So does that mean that it's right? No. What it means, though, is if you're going to go against it, if you're going to buck against it, there's a reason that PhD students write dissertations that often go against the consensus. When they do it, they have to spend damn near five years after their coursework studying that very specific topic and reading what everybody says about it. Because if you're going to buck against it, you damn well, but if you're going to come at the doctors, you better not miss, right? And that's 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 sort of the down and dirty way to say it. So that's why if I don't have an expertise on the Exodus. I don't have an expertise on Egyptian history. I don't have an expertise on... Any like most of the stuff that I write on, I didn't, I didn't write my dissertation on it. So we talk about consensus scholarship because look, here's what the secondary literature is. Here's what scholars say about this. Here are their arguments. This is why they hold to it. This is what you have to contend with. I'll jump in here too and say that when Josh says expertise, he's using that word loosely, right? Expertise in an academic sense is very different. Right? Josh is extremely well informed. With respect, you guys have figured that out, right? With respect to the Exodus and with respect to Egyptian history, right? When he says it's not his area of expertise, he means that he is not one of the handful of people in the world who can speak with the most authority to that subject, right? He can be well informed, right? In a level much beyond that of your average sort of, you know, casual person of casual interest in a topic, right? And still, you know, not consider himself an expert because there's a very high bar that you have to hold yourself to to call yourself an expert as an academic. I think in fairness to Josh, uh, he's a pretty smart dude. But to me, at least, um, I think scholarship is important when discussing biblical issues, issues, mostly because it keeps us humble, to be perfectly honest, right? I mean, I'm Christian, I'm an Episcopalian. It's not terribly important to me from the perspective of my own faith. And this isn't true for all Christians, obviously, but for me, it isn't terribly important from the perspective of my faith, whether or not the Exodus happened literally as it's described in the Bible. But the fact that this conversation happens, right? The fact that we have to have, that, that, that there is this disconnect between the evidence that I see as a scholar and the, the book that I read as a person of faith makes me have to really think about what it is that I believe, why I believe it, what it means to me. What does the Exodus mean to me as a Christian, right? Given what else I know, um, you know, and again, what I take from it is not what everyone else takes from it necessarily, but I think the scholarship really helps inform me um, of how big the world is and how big God is, right? God is bigger than any of this to me. And so, you know, I think the scholarship keeps me humble as much as anything. Thank you. Did you guys want to comment on this question? Yeah, I'd like to add uh, just a brief, uh, I guess, well, dissenting opinion, but not quite. Because here's the thing. I, I often get a lot of people say, and in fact, I have a feeling the asking for a friend comment was directed at me because me and Converse know each other quite well. Um I have somewhat of a reputation of being anti-academic and it's not true. I don't think that people shouldn't actually like take any stock from experts or that experts don't know what they're talking about or anything like that. That is, that's a major misrepresentation of my point. 
My only thing, though, is we have a, I mean, I don't know how to describe it other than idolatry of PhDs in this world, such that they can get away with almost everything. I'll give a perfect example. Uh, Idan Dershowitz, what he says about Leviticus is hilarious. Like it's his. I don't think you understand his argument, CJ. I've heard oh, your video. I, I, I don't do, think you though. understand and his it's, argument. It's just you don't. I, but it's, sorry. It's utterly I mean absurd. Start, but uh, and the fact that anybody absurd, takes right? him seriously is utterly absurd on its face. You don't right? understand Everybody his argument. Everybody knows what Leviticus says. Uh, you don't and, understand and his fact, argument. Just to be fair, when I've pressed you on that issue, Dr. Josh, you've even said, no, I'm not saying that what Dr. Dershowitz is true, uh, even though in your videos you seem to imply that it is. And I'm not, I don't want to get into the argument necessarily about whether or not it you is. Shouldn't. The point is that like um, that, like that is something where it's like people are, people are going to take this Leviticus 18 is actually implicitly accepting homosexuality things seriously. Jesus when, Christ, like, no, you don't is, understand his argument, argues. CJ. Use a different example. You don't understand his argument. Use a different example. I, I do yes. understand his example, though, and we can give plenty okay, of okay. other examples. We can give plenty oh, of other we, examples. Right? I've already given the Hittite we, we example, move on, the Assyrian Derek. example, and yeah, so on and so yes, forth. Real uh, quick. Richard Carrier is another example. I mean, mythicists. I, I love Richard Carrier, by the way. I think he's a cool dude. Uh, mythicists are not typically taken seriously in academic circles, but everybody sees that he has a PhD, and now mythicism is like a mainstream position if you ask somebody in the atheist sphere on YouTube. And like th that bothers That's me. That's just like, not true. We it totally is, though. Like, I, I oh, talk so, to these people all the so time. I gentlemen, 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 the gentlemen. Time. Let's uh, let Jonathan but, get his peek in here and we'll move on. Yeah. So uh, now. Uh, when I had my debate with uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman, and, you know, once again, we were discussing um, the text of the New Testament, the reliability, you know, what is the, the basis that we should be uh, establishing our textual criticism on? Now, one of the questions he asked me, because I recognize that the scholarship uh, of today uh, doesn't support uh, my hypothesis at all. Now, he did mention, now I, I know this is the consensus position and this is not exited uh, or this is not uh, evidence for it, but Jonathan, I, I do need you to help uh, explain to me, you know, why is that, that this is the consensus? Now, uh, I, and I do recognize the scholarship uh, in a lot of different subjects may not agree with this. And, and my answer to uh, Dr. Ehrman is while I recognize it is, there are things to help explain why those positions came to be. Now, for me, you know, I, I, I kind of brought up the, uh, the philosophical shift in thinking, the kind of break with the empirical method. You know, I, I quoted, uh, you know, Stephen Hicks, who's done that kind of showed the kind of break with the empiricism with Kant and the, the movement of postmodernism. But while I recognize, you know, from a Christian perspective, you know, if I am going to challenge going back to Dr. Josh, you know, obviously there's a lot I have to explain and research. But for my example with Dr. Ehrman, it, it was specifically, you know, to really address his concerns because you do have a legitimate concern if, hey, you're going up against, you know, what a lot of experts have said, but how do you best explain around that? Uh, and for me, it was really just trying to show the philosophical shift or the history of these ideas and how they have influenced our particular worldviews. And uh, we can move on from there. I just I just want to say that as far as idolatry and academics goes, I accept offerings in the form of cash and or. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, best to look at the evidence, right? Mm hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next super chat, hot black Desiato. Thank you. Says, can Dr. Josh comment on the fact that Pharaoh's real name is never used in the Hebrew text? Isn't Pharaoh a title? Yeah. I mean, again, this is, this is something that comes up quite a bit. And like, I think it's a source. Dr. Bryson would be able to speak to this much more, but I mean, like the writers of the Hebrew Bible know how to name Egyptian Pharaohs, right? They know how to do that. Um, so I think it, I don't think it's the strongest piece of evidence um, and I don't think that scholars think it's the strongest piece of evidence. Like Israel Finkelstein mentioned it. I'm just thinking back to that lecture that I heard a couple of days ago. Uh, but, it, but again, he said it's, it's, you know, it's, it's something that's noteworthy, but not the strongest piece of evidence. It is strange. 
It's, it's yeah. as if they're trying to make it vague. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. And I was just going to say, and just to clear up, Pharaoh is a, um, it's not exactly a title. It's kind of like saying the White House said when you talk about the president, Para means the great house, so the palace. And the Egyptians used it as well as a, an expression to refer to the king. Either, you know, sometimes when they were speaking of a specific ruler and sometimes in a literary context, when, as Josh said, they wanted the opportunity for it to be kind of vague. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate I that. Say briefly, I've never had this verified, but I have heard that that could potentially be evidence of Exodus being old because they didn't used to. The, and I don't know, maybe you could even you could comment on this, but I've heard um, people say that in the like 15th, 14th century and before it was customary to refer to Pharaoh simply as Pharaoh rather than as Pharaoh such and such. Um, I've never taken the time to verify that, but I've heard that to be the case. It's something that comes becomes more and more common as time goes on. It's something that's, you know, first really becomes typical in the New Kingdom. So, um, but it's not an argument, I don't think, I mean, for or against the historicity of the Exodus narrative. Thank you so much. Next super chat, Doc Pleromanat. Thank you so much for that super chat. In Exodus 1-5, the clan of Jacob consisted of 70. How could the great-grandchildren of the 12 sons number over 2 million? All of Egypt was two to four million. So I think this is a population question and an issue on a large exodus, I suspect. And also, how could they have become that large of a number? I don't know. Anyone want to I'm take not it? personally yeah, here to defend the, the population numbers today. I, I, um, I, I could do that in another debate. I don't have a problem with them. I just think that it, it isn't necessarily relevant to this specific issue just because I think that, I like I said earlier, I think like coming at like a almost like a minimalist position as far as did the minimal facts of a historical exodus event take place? I think that should be like the first thing we argue about. And then at that point, once we agree that the event took place, then we can agree or start to uh, dispute rather the details of the event. Like, is it 600,000 or is it something smaller than that? That's still very large, but now, not, you know, in so I'll, I'll go ahead and defend uh, the number real quick uh, uh, for Doc uh, Pleroma. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Well, first, we're talking about a period of time, um, you know, so uh, we're talking about a large expansion of time. And when we talk about the, the number, the 600,000, uh, which would equate to X amount of uh, 2.4 million. Remember, there is a mixed multitude uh, that went with them. So, you know, and that's operating on the assumption that uh, obviously they saw something there. Uh, they either spooked them uh, or came to the belief uh, they recognized what the Jewish people did uh, and they left. So we're talking about a mixed multitude went with the Jews uh, to come up with that large number. So we, we obviously have a time period of growth. Um, and then we do have a mixed multitude going with those people. To be clear, though, it's 600,000 fighting men. These are all Israel. Yeah. In the narrative, these are all Israelites, right? So that that's the, that's the basis for that, what I think is probably conservative number of two to three million. But anyway. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that. Moving on to Ethan Styles. I hope I'm saying your name right, Ethan. I've been seeing you around for a while. Thank you so much. Question for Dr. Bryson. Can you describe the relationship between Egypt and Canaan? I've heard that Canaan had to pay tribute to Egypt for a time. Yeah, in the late Bronze Age, which is the period we're discussing here when the Exodus story is set, um, most of the cities of Canaan were vassals of the Egyptian kings. So the Egyptians controlled Canaan um, as far as sort of um, securely as far as modern day Lebanon and then um, as far as um, the Euphrates River at various points in the New Kingdom. Um, there was always sort of back and forth among the empires of the region, so Mitanni and then the Hittites um, after about 1350 BC for the allegiance of most of those city states. But Canaan, southern Canaan in particular, um, but up through the sort of central part of the Canaanite coast was um, filled most with Egyptian vassals of varying degrees of loyalty. And the Egyptian army would regularly march up through Canaan to kind of cement their um, authority, their presence in that, that area. And of course, being a vassal meant paying tribute <laughs> and also supplying troops should there be conflict in the region on behalf of the Egyptians, things like that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Next super chat, Gnostic Informant for the tip jar. Thank you, Gnostic Informant. Uh, go subscribe to my friend, Gnostic Informant, Neil. I appreciate that super chat. Uh, next super chat, Jay Schroeder. Hope I'm saying your name correctly. Great content, always interesting subjects. So thank you for just uh, adding to the tip jar as well. I appreciate that. Next question, to topic discussed. My friend Gary's back. Dr. Josh and Dr. Maggie, how does one go about checking in their checking their own biases? The same question to the evangelical fundamentalist on the panel. Yeah, I mean, I can go. I can go first. Um, it's tough, right? I mean, being able to recognize what it is that you're coming to the data with is it's first of all, you have to be aware. You have to be looking for it. Um, so I, I like I'll give an example. Um, oh, that's not a good example. Anyway, yeah, I, I mean, I think being aware of it enough to try to consider your current life situation, your academic situation, your upbringing, all of those things. Um, but again, I, I don't know that you get free of bias. I don't think that you do. Uh, it's just trying to be uh, as aware of it as possible and try to not let it to the greatest extent uh, affect your model. Gentlemen, uh, I'll say, I mean, I, I don't know how well any of this works, but I'll just mention some of the things I try to do. Um, one thing I like to consider is, could I make this argument if I were um, on the opposite you know, side, as well as would I make this argument if I was on the opposite side? Because those are, of course, different questions, right? Just because I could make an argument doesn't mean I necessarily would if I had different presuppositions or something like that. Um, I also do kind of like to um come out of position of you know everybody is just presenting um their not i don't want to say their best guess because people obviously are doing very serious work here but they're um how would i say this uh i guess incomplete model right we don't have all the pieces yet and so everybody's trying to figure it out and so when i read them and you know don't necessarily take them as uh you know gospel and be able to compare them and, and that of course would apply to myself more so than them right because i'm not even an archaeologist or anything like that um, and I, I guess another position is just trying to listen as much as possible. I think that's the most difficult one, just simply because, especially in a debate, you're literally coming at it from the perspective of the people against you are wrong because otherwise you wouldn't be here. Right. Um, but you know, trying to, uh, listen is, is certainly good, I think. And hopefully I do a good job. I, I don't know that I necessarily do, but hopefully. I do. <laughs> yeah. I, I, to piggyback on what CJ was saying, I think manners go a long way. You know, the ability to listen is really absolutely key, right? And, you know, we do our best. I mean, it's hard for, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not to jump in and try to talk over people and, you know, raise my voice and get all indignant when I hear something that doesn't accord with what I think is correct. But um, just remembering what mom said, right? Just, you know, just stay quiet, listen, let the other person talk. If you don't have something nice, don't say nothing at all. <laughs> That goes a long way because when you'll hear things, right? And, and in point of fact, there, there is evidence that speaks to these issues. You know, people bring it up. You miss stuff. And if you're not listening, you're not going to catch it. Jonathan, do you want to finalize that when we move on? Yeah. You know, for me, um, you know, I, I enjoy these engagements with Dr. Josh, uh, Dr. Bryson, because I am honestly looking for, are there holes in my narrative? Is there a way that Dr. Josh or uh, Dr. Bryson can give me information to help me falsify it because there may be things I'm not seeing it. So uh, part of these interactions are really to help me also understand. I, I don't know everything. Uh, there are things that are missing. Uh, Dr. Josh is an excellent academic, whether this is his field of expertise or not. Uh, as Dr. Bryson says, he's very well informed. Uh, he's done a lot of great research in his education. So uh, for me, this kind of helps me determine I get to test my hypothesis against someone like Dr. Josh, who does have good information to share uh, that may falsify uh, these accounts. So the fact that Dr. Josh and Dr. Bryson is doing it uh, helped me, uh, you know, really test these ideas that I have. Thank you so much. Next up, Scott Duke. Thank you for the super chat, Scott. I am enjoying this debate immensely. I think Megan may have dressed Dr. Josh this morning. I don't think Scott's wrong. I think it's Scott's possible. It's possible. Very, <laughs> very, especially the tie. I mean, she had to 
maybe line it up a little. I don't know. Uh, Aram guard. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Thoughts on the possible Egyptian origins of Moses name. I believe there are some other Levites as well. So, uh, yeah, and, and actually, so I wanted to get to this in my opening, but unfortunately with everything being deleted, I didn't get, you know, the ability to get my thoughts all concise, but that's one of, I think the really good evidences of, uh, a historical exodus is, you know, you can see the name Moses, or at least what appears to be a uh, cognate in many of the Pharaoh's names, right? Like Thutmose, Achmose, uh, the even Ramesses, if you say it in its uh, original tongue, which I could not do, but I think it's like Ramesshisha or something like that. Uh, it sounds a lot like Moses. And there, uh, the, the Egyptologists, I think, say that the, um, the word there means son of, if I get, the, if I am understanding that correctly. Well, the Hebrew word, uh, means drawn out of. And while those aren't the same thing, you can certainly see how the etymology could, you know, go from one word to either of the two words or even from one to the other if one came first. Um, you know, the first thing I was suggesting is maybe they have a common ancestor. Uh, but the point there just kind of being that I, I think that that is a pretty solid evidence for a potential um, history behind the Exodus. And some of the other names include like Phineas, for example, uh, I believe Pua, which is one of the Egyptian uh, midwives, or excuse me, the Hebrew midwives in the Exodus. I believe that is uh, has Egyptian origin. Um, and I think Aaron even as well is is said to have some Egyptian um, history behind it. So, um, yeah, I, I would say that that is a, a very solid point to bring up. And I wish I would have brought it up earlier, actually. Any other comments before we move on? I think the Egyptologist probably should answer this one. <laughs> yeah, Moses um, is perfectly plausible as an Egyptian name. Mesu, right, means to be born or to, to beget or to bear. So the child of or one born of is a way of translating um, Mosa in Egyptian. Um, and as CJ said, a lot of Pharaoh's names included that element, right? So Thutmose is the one born of or begotten by Thoth or Amun Moses from Amun, right? Um, so it's a perfectly plausible Egyptian name, but it's a nickname, right? It's not his whole name. Mosa would be part of an Egyptian name. Um, and there are other, um, CJ, as you point out, e uh, Egyptian names in the Exodus story. Um, and in um, the patriarchal story, there's the famous one, right, is pa Potiphar, um, which comes from the Egyptian Padi Prey, right? So the one whom the god Prey has given. And the fact that there are Egyptian names in the text okay. is another one of these examples that you can point to either as uh, an indication that the text is historical or as, a, as evidence that it's not in that like using Mosa, which is a perfectly legitimate Egyptian name, but a nickname is kind of like saying Pharaoh, right? It's kind of like if you named a guy Jack in a story, it could be anybody. Um, also Potiphar, right? Padi prey, that, that form Padi, which means right, the one whom whoever has given is very common in the Iron Age. So after 1200, 1100 BC, that name, beca that name form becomes very, very common using different gods. The earliest attestation that we know of, of that form of name dates to the reign of Seti I. So in that sort of, you know, a little after 1300 BC range, you know, it's, it's highly inconsistent with the mid 15th century date for the, for the, the, the story, the, the patriarchal stories, the Joseph story, right? Um, right, or earlier, right, before the mid 15th century BC. Um, but it would have been very, a very plausible Egyptian name to a reader in the Iron Age. So the Egyptian names in the Bible can go either way from my perspective. And, and again, from my perspective, it suggests very much that the narrative is, um, his, is historicizing, but not historical. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, next super chat, the empty cross, any evidence that people knew about Moses before the Septuagint? Some scholars think the Exodus was fabricated just before its translation to Greek. I don't know. Um, if any, I don't I, think anyone on the panel thinks that though. Do you? No, I, it, I think, you know, what we have from, you know, Philo <coughs> of Alexandria from Josephus, uh, there, uh, you know, that they had already known about it. Uh, so th this information was already out there. Obviously, uh, they know about Moses before the Septuagint, um, you know, the, a lot of ancient historians cite him. Uh, obviously, Hecatius's Egyptian history includes a Moses element, uh, which places that b before the Septuagint. Uh, and I think as Josephus writes it in his opening, you know, from the standpoint that, 
you know, the Ptolemies came into power. They're uh, ruling this civilization that's been around for a while. Uh, the Ptolemies did have jurisdiction over Judea as well. Uh, so they really wanted to understand the constitution of the Jewish people uh, to, to better rule them. And, you know, Josephus does go into his account uh, explaining that they already have this information um, and they want to learn more about it. Hence, that was the uh, uh, that was the key to begin this work at the Library of Alexander to get it uh, at Alexandria to get that. So this information was known, at least on the basis of those empirical records uh, that they had already known about it. They just wanted more information since they're specifically dealing uh, with them in Alexandria that you had a large uh, Jewish community over there. So they wanted to understand who these people were um, and hence, you know, get their records, do a translation of the law uh, because, you know, it's one of the things that they were trying to understand about the Jews, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, they kind of thought they were strange. They worship their gods differently than us. How do we understand their uh, their laws and uh, everything that they're doing? That was kind of so this was already known that they're their neighbors. Uh, so it makes sense why they want to try to better understand them. And they would have already known about Moses. Thank you so much. Uh, getting to the next one, Genesis and Exodus are at odds, I think, writing duration of stay in Egypt. So it's a short super chat. I know it's difficult to get what you want to say in there, but uh, is that, do you see something here, Dr. Jones uh, or CJ? Well, yeah, if you want to answer first, you can definitely. I mean, these are just, this is just a question of source material, right? So looking at how many generations or is it 400 years or 430 years? It's, it's a complicated question. Um, I don't know that it, it, it doesn't really have tons of bearing necessarily here. Scholars would be in general agreement here that you have two different origin stories, right? For the nation of Israel, one's a patriarchal one and one's an Exodus origin story and bringing them together. What? Yeah, and you, I certainly would, you know, obviously would um, disagree with that. But to be fair, I don't know if it's necessarily where I would want to go with this answer, only because I think that it, it uh, I would want to explain the reconciliation just because I could do so very quickly. Uh, and of course, you, you know, people can accept it or not accept it. But uh, the Bible seems to be very consistent in interpreting 430 years as 430 years separating the Abrahamic covenant from the Mosaic covenant. Um, and therefore, the 400 years of sojourn would be considered uh, both in Egypt and in Canaan. Now, it is interesting to note that the Septuagint translation of the Bible actually says uh, the sojourn in Egypt and Canaan, whereas the modern King James Bible does not add and Canaan. Whether or not one is original and the other isn't, I don't think is necessarily relevant because what it uh, indicates there is that the people at the time thought that this was implied, right? Thought that it was uh, a sojourning in both Canaan and Egypt. And the rest of the Bible seems to demonstrate that if you count the generations, if you look at what separates the Abrahamic covenant from the Mosaic covenant and other different references that you tend to have there. Um, so I, I don't know that they are actually in contradiction and I guess that's where I'm going to end. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. We have a bunch of super chats. I'm trying to push through. I know a couple of you have appointments at around two. So please, uh, forgive me for trying to get us through these doc Pleroma. Thank you again for the super chat in Exodus 13, 17. How could there be a Philistine or Philistine to circumvent at this time? Philistines did not appear in the area until 1200 BC. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the our, our understanding of the origin of Philistines is probably flawed. Um, my reason for saying that is because the, uh, the, I mean, the Bible seems to think that they were there. Forget the Exodus. They were there at Abra in Abraham's time, right? Um, which is an even bigger problem if you want to start talking about what does that jive with our current understanding of when the Philistines arrived. Um, I would say that uh, um, I think it's very likely that there was a proto-Philistine group in the region beforehand. Uh, in fact, it might be, it could be the case, and, and others have suggested this well before me, this isn't a unique idea to me, but it could be the case that the reason the Peleset were going to the Gaza region in the first place is because it was already a kind of colony or an area where there was a large number of um, 
Greek migrants because the Pelissa do appear to be from the Aegean area. Um, and, and again, there are there are numerous people who have suggested that before me. Um, I think the, it is actually kind of a shame. The only one that's actually coming to the top of my head is um, David Roll. But Doug Petrovich is another example. There you go. Uh, and, and a lot of the guys actually at ABR, Bryant Wood and so on and so forth. Um, they would be much better to ask the question than me, but that would be sort of my short, quick answer. All right. Anyone else? Uh, brief, brief uh, answer to this as we move on. All right. Next super chat. Queen, Queen of the Heathens. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Do Jonathan and CJ have any credentials? Number two, CJ stated that getting a PhD wouldn't change his position. Doesn't this mean by default he's doing the exact retreat he was re re referencing earlier? And uh, let's try to keep it as brief as possible, gentlemen. But uh, yeah, how do you respond? Um, I, I know in terms of credentials, uh, in, in this particular field, that's why I call myself an Anglican autodidact. So I'm researched myself, but uh, I do have my MBA. Uh, so I, I do have my master's degree. I do have my undergraduate. Obviously, it's in business and statistics and computer programming. I do a lot of data science. So that's where my educational credentials are in. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, Dr. Josh and I are not d debating data science or statistical models or forecasting, <laughs> uh, or regression. So, um, obviously I'm not going to showcase any of my, uh, educational credentials, but yes, I do have my master. It's not in this field. Uh, so I don't think it would be relevant except I had to do papers and sit down and, uh, and get my degree by showing up. Uh, and doing some work. So in that regard, uh, but I don't advertise it because of the fact that uh, I'm, I'm self-educated in this particular field. Yeah, and I'll just be very quick. So answer number one, no, I do not have any credentials. Uh, answer number two, um, the it wasn't a position of a, a, like assuming my position per se or saying like the evidence couldn't convince me otherwise. Uh, rather, what I was trying to communicate in saying that was my look at these documents, whether it be the Iliad or the Sumerian Kings list or the Bible, um, is not actually based in my religious faith. Um, it's based in my understanding of how we should understand these ancient texts, which is very likely based in historical truth, even if not entirely historically accurate. Uh, I, I tend to be on the side that legends are more likely to be based in truth than not based in truth. Um, to give an example of how that would apply, it seems to me, pure face value, I don't know much about this, but it seems to me more likely that there was a historical Heracles on which the legends are based than that he is a purely fictional character and people made up legends about him, right? Um, that doesn't obviously mean he cut off the head of a hydra and two grew back, right? And maybe it's not even possible for us to deduce what is myth and what is not. But it just seems to me at face value to be more likely um, and there are plenty of, of scholars who do take that kind of a position as well, although they would be very much more nuanced than I would. And that probably would change if I did have a PhD. Uh, I'd probably be a lot better at articulating what I mean and all that kind of stuff. Um, it might also be a little bit less fundamentalist because, you know, if I wasn't a Christian. Um, so that could potentially change as well. But my only point was just to communicate uh, my idea of looking at legends in ancient texts. All right. Thank you so much. Next uh, super chat topic discussed. Thank you. Question for CJ. You stated the Egyptians would never let them go because it would be so destructive to the Egyptian economy. And you said they did leave. What evidence exists that the Egyptian economy was devastated at that time? Well, I think that's a mix of, of two different things. I think um, Mr. Sheffield said that they wouldn't let them go. And then I was uh, talking about, um, you know, like the uh, population variances and stuff like that. Um, so as far as the, like evidence of the destruction of the economy, there's very circumstantial and, and I don't necessarily want to get too much into it only because if, depending on what chronology you take, you're going to have different approaches of this. And, and I don't mean anything as drastic, even as new chronology versus conventional, um, even low chronology versus high chronology is going to give you a very different understanding because you have a different Pharaoh, you have a different economic situation going on. Uh, you even have slightly different situation going on in Canaan. So there's just a very long way of saying I don't really know and I don't want to be committal to it because I don't think that um, I don't think I can be really. Jonathan, did you want to make a brief remark? 
Um, you know, once again, this this can only be speculating because you know, um, you know, anything between the old and the the new kingdom as far as the dark ages that existed. I'm not saying that's positive for our case um, of that. That then references back to the excess of you know, you had this large group of people that uh, left. You know, you would. Uh, we would have the expectation that uh, it would have a big impact on their economy. That's why they wouldn't let them to leave. And if we, um, and, I, and I'm not holding to this firm, but we do see the sort of dark ages uh, between the old and the new kingdom. Uh, does that give any, and, and Dr. Uh, Bryson, you can definitely chime in on this because uh, maybe you'll have more expertise on this but you know in terms of any uh evidence from the standpoint i wouldn't say positive but uh it's it's definitely another curious incident uh, that we do have this uh dark age uh between the old and new kingdoms which uh circumstantial as it may be could tie back to the uh or be consistent with the exodus that impact on their economy so I'm not sure what dark age you're talking about between the old and new kingdoms. There was two inter there were two intermediate periods and a middle kingdom in between the old and new kingdoms. Um, but both um, positive dates for the Exodus occur during a very well-documented period in the history of the ancient Near East. Just to be you know, perfectly clear about the, the Egyptology there. Thank you so much. I appreciate your answers. Festering Boils, and thank you for that super chat, Gary. Thank you for this super chat, Festering Boils. Uh, sounds like he was there during the plagues with that name. If Jonathan could prove that the numbers in Exodus were unexaggerated, would he admit that he'd use that argument as evidence of the story being true? You must be muted. Yeah, let me say, if Jonathan could prove the number were unexaggerated... Would he admit that he used that argument as of it? Um, well, no. I, when you're putting or you're trying to construct an empirical history, you're trying to um, look at many elements of it. I mean, uh, Apian, for instance, you know, his attack on the account uh, had 110 or 120,000 uh, Egyptians. Now, it's still a very high number. It's not 5,000, uh, it's not 35,000, you know an Egyptian himself, you know, uh, at the court, you know, said it was 120. That was, and that was his po uh, polemical attack to sort of discredit or inverse the amount. So in terms of setting that baseline, um, you know, and, you know, it, it's difficult sometimes to look at numbers uh, from the ancient sources and give, you um, you know, how close were they? Uh, but, you, you know, um, now I, I wouldn't use it, it uh, to be true, per se. It's, it's not just the numbers. It's all these other elements, you know, I, uh, that that for me, I have to resolve um, because we're getting all these reports that something did happen uh, of that magnitude. So, um Hopefully that answers uh, Festering Boyle's uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Gnostic Informant, thank you for the super chat. Is it possible that the Exodus is an allegory for Egypt losing stronghold in Canaan? Let's start with uh, Dr. Josh and Maggie real quick, just briefly, if you don't mind, and then uh, briefly have you comment if you want. Uh, yeah, I mean, allegory, I, it certainly could be a memory of that, right? I mean, it could factor in. Um, I think Naaman made an argument about that recently, but I mean, it's certainly nothing new. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it certainly could factor in, uh, because again, it's when you have that sort of firm control and then, you know, Egypt <clears throat> following the, the decline in the Mediterranean loses control of the region. It's like freedom from that oppression. All right. All right. Um, let me move on, gentlemen and uh, ladies, if you don't mind here. Mr. Monster, thank you for the super chat. Did Canaanites in Egypt worship Yahweh, El, or Baal, or El Elyon, Baal El? Can we even know for sure empirically, could they have mashed gods into one? 
So this is definitely a really interesting question because L is, it, it appears to be a Canaanite deity, but it's also a generic word meaning God. Um, and, and Baal has the same problem. It appears to be a deity, but it's also a generic word meaning Lord as well as a generic word meaning husband. And sometimes it can refer to more than one deity. Like, for example, Baal Hadad is the Lord Hadad. Um, you know, he's not actually the end. Um, I think actually, if I remember correctly, I do believe in the Bible, there is at least one usage of Baal to refer to Yehovah. Um, so it, it can be kind of an interesting and complicated question there. It gets more complicated by the fact that there is clear syncretism, I think, in the region. Right. Um, for example, we have. I, well, first, the Bible just says so. Right. So we know that even from the Bible's own perspective, there was mixing of the Israelite religion with the Canaanite religion. Right. Uh, but if we just you know look at the archaeological record as well. We'll see like um, archaeological evidence of uh, Yehovah and his Asherah, right, which is like a wife named Asherah. Um, what's the indication there? Well, that there was some syncretism going on here, that the, the worshippers of Yehovah were also syncreti- uh, synchronizing with the Canaanite religion. Um, as far as in origin, um, Yehovah does appear to be unique to the Israelites. There is record of him potentially elsewhere. Like, for example, some will say that uh, he's referenced as uh, Yehovah the Shasu. Um, but first off, it's not actually the same spelling. It's actually yud heh vav not yud heh vav hey. And secondly, it's probably a toponym and not actually the name of a deity. Um, so as far as worship in origin of Yehovah, that appears to be unique to the Hebrews uh, and originate from them. And we can't really go much farther than what we have, biblically speaking, because there's just no extra biblical evidence to go farther. Uh, the other names there, very much a different story. Dr. Josh, did you want to make a brief comment or are we moving on? Or uh, It's just such a complicated question. Uh, it would take 10 minutes to say anything about it. Thank you. Thank you. Time. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, next super chat, Jason. I don't want to butcher your last name. Thank you. There an eruption in 1613 BCE? I personally don't think it had anything to do with it. If people are interested in that, um, the entire center section of the 2015 publication, um, Exodus from a Transdisciplinary Approach, that was the publication of a 2013 conference where essentially all the experts in the Exodus came together to discuss the topic. Um, they discuss it from that, you know, sort of naturalistic approach, trying to see these as the story still being describing actual events, but, you know, from a, from a naturalistic perspective. And they, they talk quite a bit about that eruption. So. All right. And Jason comes back with house of Ramesses or name in 1613 BC. Um, so I, I think this is actually probably a later redaction. Uh, this is just my personal opinion, but. Um, my view on the Torah is that it was probably originally written by Moses and has redacted uh, redactions later on, more than likely done during the 1000s BC, which is when they would have been using terms like land of Ramses and house of or not house, excuse me, um, city of Ramses. Um, the interesting thing about it is when we see these names, it does uh, appear to be anachronistic to apply, like, for example, the name of Avaris. Would not be Avaris, and it would be P. Ramses, the, the city in the general region, at least, because uh, they're not actually the exact same city. Um, and, and so it seems anachronistic to have a figure like Moses calling this place Ramses. At the same time, though, it's equally anachronistic to have somebody in the 600s BC calling the place Ramses, because they hadn't called it that for 300 years at that point. Um, so it appears that there's a redaction of an original Torah sometime around the. Um, 1000 era BC. And interestingly enough, there is Jewish tradition that supports that, actually. Um, there is Jewish tradition which suggests that uh, Samuel and Joshua both, Samuel being around that 1000 BC period, um, did actually have minor redactions to the Torah. Um, so it's not just something that is, uh, you know, pulled out of a hat per se. It actually does have historical precedent. So, Dr. Maggie, uh, I know that you have an expertise in this direct field. Would you comment on that? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Can you tell me what the specific question was again real quick? I'm... Yeah. Um, so I think uh, CJ kind of rabbit trailed into 
just the names that are being used anachronistically and things like that. But this. Oh, was I got it. House of Ramses were name in 1613 BC. Um, I'm not sure what, what the 1613 date means. In 1613, you know, so. The volcano are, eruption, I think it is. Gotcha, the Thera eruption. So there's a series of, of cities in the Eastern Delta. So Avaris, right, which was the Hyksos capital. It's a Middle Kingdom settlement that becomes the capital of the Hyksos dynasty. Um, uh, that then this, you know, in the, at the beginning of the Ramesid period, so under Horemheb um, and later, um, this new, site called Kantir um, becomes important. So they, be, they start sort of establishing an urban uh, settlement there. And under Ramses II, that becomes the capital city of Egypt, effectively. And it's named P. Ramesse, which means, or Per Ramesse, which means the House of Ramses. Um, and a lot of people have tried to make arguments regarding an exodus or the date of a possible exodus on the basis of those settlements. There's not really any particular reason why in the Iron Age no, people wouldn't have known that Pira Messe was, you know, the Bronze Age name of that site. Um, monuments of Ramses II were still standing. They are still standing in the area. Um, and it's true that if, right, the, the later text is referring to an event that happened in that area, they might have chosen the name Pira Messe because these cities, right, and later, of course, Tanis, are all very close together. You know, they it's sort of almost sort of seems like sort of evolution of settlement in that area. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Ronald Angel. Thank you for the super chat. Egyptian historiography did not permit records of what was considered embarrassing and ignomin ignominious defeats of the pharaoh. True or false? That's definitely you, uh, Dr. Bryce. I'll take that question. It depends on the context. The ancient Egyptians were very uh, willing and capable of making fun of um, and undermining their kings. Official documents rarely recorded defeats explicitly. The Egyptians did not like to admit that anything had gone wrong. That is correct. Um, and given that, it's really fascinating how many um, instances there are where we can really tell, in spite of the reluctance of the Egyptians to record a defeat or a problem as a defeat or a problem, we could infer from a lot of other kinds of evidence that something did go wrong. So like the Battle of Kadesh is the famous example, right? The Egyptians recorded as a victory of Ramses II, when in fact, it was at best to draw probably um, a defeat. We have Hittite records that clarify that the Hittites thought that they had won. Um, and if you read the Ramesid narrative carefully, right? If you read Ramses II's accounts carefully, you can kind of see that they got out by the skin of their teeth, um, you know, the whole story, right, is of the Egyptians almost losing and Ramses, through his own strength, right, even his, his army sort of fell apart, holding things together long enough for help to get there and the Egyptians to get out um, alive. Um, I guess the question I have to probe just to ask boldly, bluntly, based on this amazing super chat is, can we imagine a mass exodus of that large scale of people if we assume the numbers there and they don't document it because they're embarrassed? Does that actually even work in that kind of question? The Egyptians tended when there was a problem to try to come up with a counter story um, or often seem to have tried to come up with counter stories. So like in, in cases where someone usurped the throne, um, that person, we often sort of see a flurry. Right? When somebody came to the throne in unusual circumstances, we see a flurry of writing and art that make the claim very loudly that they didn't it didn't actually usurp the throne. That the lady doth protest too much is kind of a a thing that we see happen in Egyptian history and literature. So like um, Hatshepsut, right? She's this female pharaoh um, and, you know, her coming to the throne was irregular, it was unusual. And there were other claimants to the throne. So, you know, she had, you know, her court had these narratives composed where, you know, her father appointed her his heir when she was a child, all of this retroactively. Right, these narratives are all over the walls, right? They're, you know, seeing you know, artistic sort of representations of her divine birth as the child of Amun, things like that, right? Accounts of oracles proclaiming her king. So we see these flurries of activity sort of saying, you might have heard that I'm a usurper, but in fact, I am not. And let me tell you about that in great detail. So something like the Exodus, we might have expected the Egyptians to try to come up with a good story about. Um, there are, you know, like plagues, right? This, this great plague um, of the 14th century BC, the Egyptians don't, nobody's, you know, we don't have a, a thing where somebody sat down and wrote about its precise effects on Egyptian society. 
But, you know, we have this flurry of statue making of the goddess Sekhmet, right? The protective goddess against illness. We have you know, magical spells against illness. Um, so, yeah. The well, Egyptians uh, officially know. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I just wanted to say it now. I'm, I'm more than certain there would be a little bit of issue taken simply because I don't know that I don't know that Dr. Josh and Dr. Bowen would take as much stock from somebody like Manetho or what we have from him. Um, but what I would say is I, I think there is what Manetho <laughs> demonstrates is that it is definitely very possible that we don't have records which actually show exactly that. Right. Namely, the the um, the Egyptians sort of weaving the story in such a way that it's better for them. Oh, well, these were actually leprous people of a rebellious priest. And so we expelled them kind of thing. Right now. Um, is that true? Is it not? I, it, to a certain extent, it's, it's not an argument from silence because we do have record of Manetho actually presenting a polemic, but Manetho is fairly late in the record. I think he's in the 300s or 400s. Um, so it would be nice to get something farther back from him. My reason for bringing him up would just be to say um, that I think it's likely we could actually discover some records which show Manetho was maybe uh, drawing upon an earlier historical source, which did try to paint the Exodus in such a way that it wasn't embarrassing. Um, you know, there's still a lot to be found. Uh, and, and I think it's important for us to always kind of remember that. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate that. Crash the party. I appreciate you, my friend, super chatting. And uh, it's this question for Dr. Josh. When you decided on a suit today, were you deciding to also not get into a street fight? <laughs> Is it the boomer in me that's not getting that? Somebody help me out. Yeah, it's, it's he's just... Uh, Josh can fight in the suit. If he fights yeah, in that's, the suit, yeah. Oh, I see. Yes. No, see, I, I think you got it all wrong. Dr. Josh is actually secretly like James Bond, and he's going to go do some food <laughs> in the suit. Good one, CJ. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for the super chats. I appreciate it. History of the Goddess, show and love. Thank you so much. May the Goddess bless you. Uh, let's see. Keeping on, keeping on. They're, now we're getting down to the bottom of the barrel here. I'm just trying to make sure I cover everybody and don't miss anything. My good friend, John Gear, thank you so much for the super chat. According to the Bible, Moses lived to be 120 years old. Do CJ and Jonathan believe that to be true? Um, it, it has no bearing on the debate today, but yes, yes, I do. All right, Jonathan? Yeah, no, I agree it to be true. And I might as well for the other side, because uh, Maggie is a Christian, right? So, But do you believe that Moses lived to be 120 years old? To be honest, I just don't think about it. And Josh? I'm not 100% sure that Moses did or did not exist. So it's <laughs> interesting certainly, spectrum. Certainly if he certainly if he did, I he didn't live to be. I like that. If, I'm I would say the same thing. If Moses existed, I see no reason why not. All right. Thank you so much. Stop scamming, man. Thank you for the super chat. Mernetha mentions crushing Israelites, but only in passing on second to last line on an 8-foot tablet. Wouldn't he make a bigger deal if the exodus happened? I don't necessarily think so. Um, if the if you take the 15th century date, uh, as most traditionalists or fundamentalists would, um, the Merneptah Stella is some 200, 250 years separated, so it may not necessarily be uh, important for them. It'd be kind of like us having a war with Britain um, today or even a couple decades from now. No, no, it would be today, actually. Uh, having a war with Britain today and then kind of referencing the the Revolutionary War if they crushed us or something. You know what I mean? It'd be a little bit um, outside of, of their purview, maybe. Um, but that being said, what the Merneptus Stele, I think, does demonstrate is by the 13th century BC, there is a singular group of people who are one cohesive culture who can be called Israelite. Uh, and I think that's very important because a lot of people for a long, you know, Israel Finkelstein used to say that they developed in like the 9th or 10th century. I don't think anybody would make that position anymore. Uh, in fact, Dr. David Falk has, has said very um, recently that um, a, a lot of those kinds of positions are kind of being done away with. And I don't know how right or wrong that is, but that you know that's at least one expert in the field who seems to be uh, who seems to be arguing that that is the case. Um, so let's be let's be let's be clear. There's a difference between a group known as Israel 
uh, being in the highlands of Canaan in 1207 and the full, full-fledged what we would consider to be Israel uh, that existed in the Iron Age, right? Oh, totally um, agree. Totally agree. Um, but I would note if if my interpretation of chronology is true, that's actually expected because the 1200s would be the judges period when they're actually a tribal confederation, right? So um, to see the emergence of a kingdom 200 years later uh, or a, a nation, so to speak, um, would actually be perfectly consistent with the traditionalist model. I mean, I'll disagree. I think it's strange that through the Amarna period, uh, and of course, Maggie, feel free to comment, uh, if you have a massive group of people having taken over Egyptian territory in Canaan, that they don't show up at all uh, in the Amarna period texts, um, that's incredibly problematic. I agree. If it were a coordinated campaign, if a, a an army, even even not an army thousand strong, right? The, the Amarna texts talk all the time about a Piru, right? These sort of stateless people who, you know, harassed or harried the local rulers of Canaan, right? So the Canaanite rulers will write to the Egyptians saying, hey, we've got problems with the Apiro, send us some troops. You know, the Egyptians were well aware of what was going on in Canaan at the time. And were there a a people called Israel who called themselves Israel, you know, making trouble in Canaan at the time, chances are that they would have showed up under that name. Unless, you know, I mean, you want to think of this Apiru phenomenon. Yeah, and again, there's good reason, right? Right, Josh, um, Kyle McCarter talking about David as an Apiru uh, ruler back in the day. And, you know, there, there are people who have argued that, that this Apiru phenomenon may have contributed to the origin of the Israelite state. But, you know... We would have expected them to show up. Yeah, and I mean, when you know when these local rulers are writing to the to the Pharaoh and the Amarna letters, you know, it's not like send thousands and thousands of troops to deliver us. You know, it's send fifty, right? Send fifty soldiers, and they'll take care of it. So, um, yeah, these are all things that make this an incredibly complex discussion. But sort of coming at this, I think, holding one text and saying. Let's see if we can make this text, you know, continue to work. I, I think that's problematic. You're muted. Hi, Derek. I think you're on mute again. I think I did that because I had to give my wife a smooch, and I didn't want you all hearing. So uh, Stop Scamming Man is back. He says, why doesn't the Bible mention Egypt seizing the Near East in 1458 B.C. and holding it for centuries? Uh, well, the seizing is just probably before the exodus actually happened if it's 1458 bc i think people usually date the exodus to about 1446 if they're doing uh, a late date now you know are, are we committed necessarily to a specific date well when you have chronologies that are up in the air i guess it's not a good idea right um so maybe not uh but it is entirely possible that this just happened before the exodus occurred and that it seems to be likely if you just take a straightforward interpretation of the chronologies uh now as far as egypt being in control of the region um, I think many have argued before me, like ABR, David Roll, and others, uh, Dr. David Falk, and, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, they would argue that Egyptian power, again, has it really is very dominant in the lower region, like Sinai and the Negev and the coastal regions, but not so much in the Judean highlands. Uh, it's not that they don't have control there. It's just that it's not quite as defined as it would be elsewhere. Um, and the Hittites sometimes take control, the Assyrians sometimes take control, sometimes they're even kind of independent uh, for a small period of time. Um, and so I think that would be probably a main reason for it. Although, you know, there is kind of reference to it in a sense, which is that, um, you know, Solomon kind of appears to be a vassal of Egypt, if we read um, the Bible straightforward. I mean, he has a wife who's a pharaoh. I don't think a pharaoh is just passing out wives to people. Um, but, you, you know, it is marries the Pharaoh's daughter. I think that might indicate I he would be some kind of a um, vassal or some uh, or something like that. And so there's little indications there, potentially. Um, but, yeah, that, that's all I'd say. All right. Are we moving on or? All right. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Topic discussed. My boy, Gary. Thank you for the super chat. Dr. Maggie, 
Is there evidence that the Egypt that Egypt experienced an economic destruction due to the loss of a large number of slaves during the time of Exodus? No. That's an easy one, though. No. Awesome. And I just say I, I think it, it for <laughs> our position, it certainly depends on who you ask. Um, like, for example, I think inspiring philosophy would say, no, we don't have that evidence yet. I think a lot of people at ABR would say, yes, we do have evidence like that. Uh, I am certainly not qualified to give you anything there, so I won't I won't contend for it per se. And if you wanted to, to point to any of the specific, you know, items of evidence that, that they would bring up, I'd be happy to address them. You know, but from my perspective, the answer there is no. All right. Thank you so much. Danny, Phil, Tom. And if I... If oh, I yeah. could, sorry, just real quick. And Dr. Bryson, what what is your, as far as a chronological period of Egyptian history, what is your focus? Uh, the New Kingdom period into the Third Intermediate period, so the end of the Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age. I just wanted to point that out to everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate your comments, everybody, in these super chats. Danny, at Phil did you want to comment again on that, Maggie? <laughs> No, I just I, wanted to say, right, there are instances, right, of, of turmoil, of economic downturn um, that occur right throughout the period. But um, to attribute any of them to a mass exodus of slaves is, I think, um, well beyond what the evidence can support. Thank you so much. It'll appreciate it. Appreciate it. Danny at Phil Talk. Go subscribe to Phil Talk if you want to talk philosophy. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. Can Dr. Josh account for the transcendental necessus? <laughs> <laughs> this guy hijacking this uh, Q and A. You're funny, uh, Doctor Josh. Account for the transcendental necessity of thought given the predict the preconditions of the Platonic state of his own universal existence. Danny Listen, Wong. his Kantian metaphysics don't <laughs> uh, supply the intelligibility necessary uh, to substantiate the ultimate grounding of all being uh, in three dimensional existence of this plane. So, uh, you yeah. know. <laughs> To that. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says Josh for prime mover. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Appreciate the uh, little bit of humor here in the middle of all of this. Considering, uh, is it Phlebas? I hope I'm saying that right. Hi. The Old Testament knew about the Hittites who lived circa 1700 to 1500 BC, I suspect. Isn't it possible it also preserved the other historical information from such antiquity? Yeah, so I would uh, encourage, considering Phlebas, to go pick up... Um, I don't know. Like just, just go to David Friedman's. It's just because it's accessible. Um, Anchor Bible Dictionary. Just look up the Hittites and read through it and see uh, what the article says about when you get to the usage of the term Hittite or Amorite or Canaanite. How is it used in the biblical text? And does it refer to the Hittites that we're referring to? Awesome. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being patient with me getting through all the Q&A. I think we're we're wrapped up on all the questions, super chatted questions. And um, any final statements? Don't don't be too long because everybody's got things to do today. But if you don't mind wrapping this up with a final statement from each of you. And ladies first. That's that's yes. Yeah. I enjoy talking with you all and hearing the questions uh, from your audience, Derek. Um, I think it's I do think it's an important thing to keep discussing, and I'm glad that we can have these conversations, regardless of anyone's credentials or background or perspectives. It's it's important to a lot of people, and so I'm always happy to talk about it and share whatever it is that I can contribute. So thanks for this opportunity, and I wish your audience well. Happy holidays. You too. Uh, let's yeah. uh, with Dr. Josh. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I don't think that this is a topic that uh, any – I mean, I'm sure there are some, but I don't I don't think most scholars would hold that this is some sort of an elitist thing that only they should be talking about. Uh, and I'm actually really happy uh, to see that, you know, people are are doing the research and trying to engage with this as, you know, utilizing what sources that they have. Um, again, as I always say in these types of conversations, at the end of the day, uh, check your conclusions, right? I, I know I talk a lot about consensus scholarship, but the reason that I do that is because there are people that dedicate their lives to these to these topics, and it's incredibly valuable what they say about it. So whatever position you you end up holding, make sure that it you know that that, that it accounts for um, and respects the models that first of all the data that they're using, 
and the models that they're then utilizing to uh, you know account for those data. So, all right, CJ or Jonathan. Yeah, I'll just say a, a couple of brief things. First off, I, I definitely want to thank uh, Drs. Bone and Bryson for um, taking time out of their day because I, you know, the, the while I certainly appreciate the graciousness you guys give, I am a YouTuber who just struck 700 today with no credentials whatsoever, who has very clear fundamentalist bias, and you could have just, nope, you know what I mean? So I very much appreciate having this conversation, um, and I, I absolutely um, adore the opportunities, right? Uh, I also just want to say briefly, because I do at the end of every debate, uh, Proverbs 27 says, let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider and not your own lips. It also says later, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The reason I bring that up is just simply to say, if I did a great job here today, if you thought Jonathan did a great job here today, if you thought that we presented good evidence, then say so yourselves. It doesn't do us any good for us to say that we did anything good. And if you think that the opposite is true, also say so yourselves, because we're never going to get any closer to the truth if we're surrounded by yes men. Uh, and of course, that goes for everybody. Right. So um, I think regardless of our um, of our theological presuppositions or anything like that, that's definitely some good words of wisdom. And I would just like to uh, pass it on to everybody. Thank you. Jonathan? Uh, yeah, once again, uh, thank you again, Dr. Josh. I know we've talking on, uh, on a number of issues in the past, but uh, once again, it's always a pleasure. You're always a class act. Uh, obviously, you always dress and look better than me, so I'm probably <laughs> a little upset about that. But uh, now I, I, I do say this out to the audience. Anyone who takes the time uh, to speak with Dr. Josh outside of these conversations, or even during, he, he's a class act, um, definitely uh, such a warm and friendly person, uh, and is always there to really help and understand your different ideas. So, um, and, and same thing, uh, uh, Dr. Bryson, uh, thanks for your input. Uh, you have a wealth of knowledge uh, that you were able to add to this conversation. And, you know, I, I think it's important to understand the other side that we should not be uh, uh, operating in an echo chamber. This is an opportunity to share ideas and thought. And, you know, what Dr. Josh says, it's important to understand why, um, you know, uh, the academies do reach conclusions and we should definitely do the due diligence in really understanding that. So uh, thank you, Dr. Josh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bryson, for giving me the opportunity to at least share my views on this. Thank you. And I want to say oh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just, I, my, my apologies. I just want to say really briefly, I, I do have an open mic after show today. If anybody wants to join, um, there is, I, I have pretty strict rules, um, but everybody is invited if you guys want to continue the conversation. Um, and that includes the audience. All right. And I want to thank, uh, first of all, both of our PhDs for giving the opportunity to do this. Uh, they didn't have to. Uh, Jonathan approached me and I want everyone who's going, well, why are there non two PhDs? There's people who aren't PhDs talking to PhDs. This is unfair. I've been hearing that a lot lately. And I want to go ahead and address the elephant in the room and say, first of all, Jonathan's my friend and uh, more important than our ontological positions. And he approached me saying, would you see if they'd be interested in having something like this? He would love to have that. I, Myth Vision, Derek here, would be happy to have more PhDs come, um, like Dr. Falk and others, but Dr. Falk doesn't do debates, but others that are experts in the field, that are interested in the topics, to have these debates, maybe with Dr. Josh and Dr. Bryson. So, it's not that I'm closed off. It's I haven't been headhunting, so to speak, to try and make this happen. Jonathan did the work and came to me and said, can we do this on your platform? So I said, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. So uh, I want to thank every one of you. CJ, it's really good to meet you. And um, Likewise. let's do this again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you heard, like the video. Thanks for all the super chats. Those help support us in doing what we're doing. And let's have another one of these in the future. Maybe some follow-ups. I got to get Bryson back on. Dr. Bryson, you're just too much fun. So we have to have you back for sure. And the babies won the day, by the way. All the kids that showed up in the... I wish all of them popped that up. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, real quick, let's see that baby. Oh, so far, Patea. Hey.
Oh, <laughs> lovely baby. Look, she's up. She's famous. She's famous. <laughs> she won the debate. She that won. Amazing. She won. All the little babies won. So thank you so much. Doc Pleroma said, Dr. Josh, Papa's or CJ's for crab cakes. I don't understand it, but thank you for the super chat. <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys understand this? Not at all. But I, uh, <laughs> thank God. It's not just me. <laughs> but I'll take uh, crab cakes uh, if anyone's uh, willing to contribute to Miss Vision, and uh, he'll order it for us. So, yeah, thank you so much for this time, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna leave with our little outro from Tombstone. I hope you feel where I'm coming from. Like the video, share this with someone who might want to know about the Exodus, and join the Patreon if you want hundreds of videos, early access. You can kind of steer the direction of questions. I interview experts in person asking your questions. And then there you have a specific video with a PhD and, and your name being mentioned in it. So thank you so much and have a wonderful Saturday family. Don't any of you have that guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.